To start off, I haven't gotten much sleep over the past few months. My insomnia has gotten really bad, and my doctors act as if I'm medication-seeking whenever I ask for help. Anyway, the house that I'm in currently, I know for a fact, has some kind of beings living in this big hedge in the backyard. They've been seen all around the house, though. I saw one on a snowy day, run from behind my neighbor's parked RV to behind one of those weird trees that looks like a bunch of skinny trees just growing from the same spot. I'm not sure the name of the specific type of tree, but the main point is that you can see through to the other side pretty easily between the little trunks. Anyway, I saw what appeared to be a fat little man, about a foot tall, run from the RV to behind the tree. So, without breaking eye contact with the tree, in case whatever it was ran, I walked over to see if I could find footprints or something, in case maybe it was a rabbit. I got to it, and of course, there were no footprints, nothing in the tree, not even a rabbit or a squirrel. I knew what it was, but I just decided to leave it be, and went back inside. A few months later, my little brother saw the same looking thing run in between two of the same types of trees that I mentioned earlier, just on the other side of my house. All he said was it looked like a tiny roundish man, running, definitely on two legs, and again, no footprints. It was muddy that day, so if it had been an animal, there should have been footprints. It seems to me like they use those specific trees as some kind of portal or entryway to something. So that's the first being that I had questions about. The second has been happening a lot more recently, and is why I mentioned at first that I have insomnia, because that very well could be what the cause of this was. Our minds are fragile things when not being cared for properly after all. Within the last month or so, I have seen this thing in my living room. I sleep in my living room because I have too much anxiety to sleep in the back end of my house. I have babies, and if something were to happen, I feel like I wouldn't hear it. Both times I've seen this figure, I've been laying in bed trying to sleep. I'll roll over and look at my brick fireplace, and I'll see this tiny little humanoid type thing run for just a split second. But it's not fast. It seems like it's a slow motion echo of a child running. I'm not very good at describing these things, but I will try. It was transparent, but I could make out what seemed like bones. It honestly looked like an x-ray or an ultrasound of a child. It was like a sheer white color, like a ghostly skeleton in a way. It had a disproportionately large head and a tiny body. It couldn't have been more than 10 inches tall. As I mentioned before, it looked like I had just seen a slow motion flash of this thing running. It just kind of dissipated after I saw it. I've seen this thing twice in almost the same spot. The spots are maybe five to 10 inches away from each other. I saw it the first time almost a month ago and then last night as well. I was hesitant to tell this story because I had recently heard from people that talking about seeing dwarves or elves or fae will just piss them off. I don't really know. I just wanted to share the experience and ask if anybody has any idea about what this could be. I'm still thinking fae, but not sure. It doesn't feel bad. It seems more playful or curious, but I know things like this can easily deceive. Any input is appreciated. So, let me know if you have any ideas. About three years ago, I went camping with my girlfriend, now ex, as she had always expressed interest but had never been. The spot we went to is in the Huron National Forest and is my go-to trail and camp spot as it's hidden deep in the forest and the access to the trails is close and easy 
for ATVs and things like that. My family has been going to this spot for about six years, and my friends introduced me about ten years ago. We went on a weekend trip, and I'm glad we didn't go for any longer. When we got there, everything was going well. Except, we did notice a group of people hanging out next to our campsite. Still, they were just stargazing and ended up leaving, so it was weird, but not spooky at all. Then around midnight is when the weird stuff started to happen. At first, it sounded like someone was laughing at us, but the laugh never ended and got very high-pitched and sounded as if it just kept going. After a while, we both got kind of scared and went into the tent to try to sleep. That's when the laugh noise moved up higher and then started to circle the campsite. After a while of that happening, it just suddenly stopped and then it started again around 3 a.m. When it started again, the fire was going out, so I went to stoke the fire with my shotgun in hand and turned on my flashlight to see if maybe I could see any coyotes or something around the campsite, but I didn't see anything or hear any movements below. This went on until 6 a.m. when it finally stopped, and that was finally when we could get some rest. After waking up, we checked the campsite and saw nothing unusual, so we packed up. Once we were packed up and good to go, I started my vehicle, which was completely dead. That really freaked me out, as I'm always paranoid about leaving things plugged in that kill the battery, and I made sure everything was closed properly and unplugged. Yet somehow, the battery still died. I got a jump from AAA. That phone call was hard to explain, and the lady who took the call didn't believe me, but in the end we both laughed, and we did get some help. After that happened, I told my friend who had shown me the campsite, and also has a cabin in the same forest, about 25 miles away from the campsite, about what had happened, and he got really freaked out. He told me about two incidents that he's had, one at the campsite, and one at his cabin. At the campsite, he stated that one night, after we'd all returned from trail riding and went to bed, he stayed up to hang out by the fire and have a few drinks. While hanging out, he was just looking off into the distance, and he saw a pair of eyes up in the trees, looking directly at him. He described them as bioluminescent. He flashed his high-powered flashlight at them, but there was nothing there. And as soon as the flashlight turned off, they were looking right back at him. So he packed up and went to bed. He didn't tell us because he didn't want to scare us. At the cabin, he was hanging out with his brother, and they were both just chilling by the fire outside, when they saw a pair of eyes looking at them from a trail that led into the woods. They stated that at the height the eyes were looking at them, whatever it was had to be over seven feet tall. They started shooting at it with their rifles, and the eyes disappeared. But once they were done, they reappeared and were closer. At that point, they both freaked out and got back in the cabin, and they didn't leave until daylight. We have no idea what this could have been, but we all felt very scared when these events happened. After we all talked about it, one of the brothers thought that it might have been a Wendigo. I don't know what it could have been, but I haven't felt that scared before or since. I was in Germany participating in a military exercise. Being an American, this was my first time in Europe, and also my first time in Germany. I loved being there, as I have a huge fascination with military history, especially World War II. 
This is important because it might have something to do with my unexplainable occurrence. We headed out to do some training. Our location was deep in the German countryside. There were some other military units out there training with us. Aside from them, any real civilization was miles away. At this particular point, we had been out for three days or so. We still had about a week to go, and we weren't expecting anything crazy to happen this early in the week. That's when we got attacked by the people who pretended to be the enemy. While most units received a direct attack, we did not. Tasked with providing communications to our artillery unit, our position was farther away. My best estimate is that we were at least two kilometers away from everybody else. To add to this, we were on top of a huge hill, so our radio signals could reach farther and be more effective. Regardless, we still needed to pull security to be safe. I happened to be the first one on guard shift that morning, so I grabbed our machine gun and headed out from our vehicle. As I mentioned, the hill was huge. As such, there was only one way to approach it, a tank trail. This trail went from the bottom of the hill all the way to the top where we were. The top of the hill was flat for the most part, but there was another smaller hill to the left of the road. To get to the bottom of the small hill, you would follow the road to the top and then go about 30 meters to your left. This small hill was the perfect spot to set up a machine gun nest, so that's where I put it. Based on the position, it was impossible to come up behind me. The hill was quite steep and was covered with heavy brush and dense trees. The foliage was so thick, in fact, that the only way to approach my position was from the direction I was looking. Fast forward 30 minutes or so, and the sun is just starting to rise through the trees. It was so quiet and peaceful, and I sat on guard enjoying the beauty of Germany when it happened. I heard a very distinct, hushed voice say, Hey! Almost as if it was right next to me. It seemed like someone was trying to get my attention without making too much noise. The wind wasn't blowing. The birds weren't chirping. All I could hear was this whisper. I looked around to make sure that nobody had somehow been able to sneak up on me, but there wasn't a soul in sight. The rest of my squad was a good 100 meters away, in the vehicle, and I couldn't even hear them. It freaked me out, but I had no choice but to stay at my post. I tried to brush off the incident, but then my sergeant tried to sneak up on me a couple of hours later. I caught him, though. He hadn't realized how steep the hill was, nor how covered in brush. I heard him coming a mile away. He congratulated me for having my head on a swivel and doing the right thing. We started to talk, and that's when he told me a story that made my blood run cold. The area we were training in was a World War II battlefield. A lot of American soldiers from our sister unit had died around those parts. They'd had no artillery support, and the Germans were so well dug in they couldn't do anything about it. That information, combined with the World War II ammo cans and machine gun belts we found there, helped me put two and two together. I'm not sure what to think about this. I have no explanation for why I heard this voice. I believe in the supernatural, but I also believe in trying to find a logical explanation first. The thing is, nothing adds up. I wasn't tired, there was nobody around me, and there were no other sounds in the forest. Part of me believes that it was the spirit of a soldier from our sister troop, still fighting, hoping that I would help. But at the end of the day, the truth is, I don't know. So this story might be a bit long, but it sure was a fun one. For me personally, anyway, as I rather enjoy these kinds of things. I come from a very religious family, and a lot of us have had paranormal encounters. 
My grandmother's house was haunted by someone who apparently hung themselves in the backyard many years before they even built the house. To this day, they frequently have priests come in and bless every room in the house. So many of my family members have been able to see things that the regular eye cannot, including me from a young age, when I used to see things in my house, which once even drove me to run into a locked door hard enough to get a concussion. That's another story for another day. Anyway, this story takes place around late October of last year. I am a student at Stellenbosch University in South Africa, so most of my friends lived in their own flats around campus. And my one friend, Bianca, had lived in a small one-person flat that was really quiet and small, basically a long hallway of a room leading onto a balcony. So we all used to hang out in her room while listening to music, playing Uno, drinking beer, and getting really stoned until early in the morning, as all good students do. We had this game that we called the Universe Game, where you basically just ask the universe a question, and she had this mega playlist of songs, so she would put it on Ultimate Shuffle, and whatever song would play after the question would be the universe's answer whatever interpretation you took from it and worked for you. So there had been a couple of nights where we'd been hanging out and the lights would just start to flicker in weird beats. Now, my friends didn't know at the time that I could feel these kinds of things coming before and as they happened. So they just dismissed it as the switch just freaking out a little bit. But this kept on happening more and more each day until one night, we were all playing the game again, and when the answer came, the lights acted up again. This time, we looked over to the light switch and saw a faded white hand at the switch, just the hand, flicking the switch. It just disappeared, and the lights went back to normal. At this point, everyone was freaking out, but I was really just kind of excited by it. For some reason, it just didn't feel like a threatening presence. It was oddly playful to me. I kept this to myself and just played along with everyone else's reactions. So one night, a few weeks after that, my friends were all out of town and I had a key to my friend's place. I decided I would go over there and stay for a few nights just to hang out and draw on my favorite couch. It all went smoothly and I was actually getting some nice work done. I had been playing the universe game a lot throughout this time. And this one night, close to 3 a.m., I was drawing and playing the game. I decided to go onto YouTube to find a random playlist to mix things up. Because, I don't know, I'm a rebel like that. So I find one. I ask a couple of questions and things go smoothly, and as I'm drawing, I suddenly just get a weird surge of energy through me and at the same time, the lights start going bananas. I look down at my phone, and the song playing is called Ghost. I had not smoked nearly enough to make that up or to see that. Anyway, I jumped up and looked around to see whatever was going on, but as usual, it ended as soon as it started. I must say that this was one of the more pleasant experiences I had ever had in this line of things and I'm not even getting into my sleep paralysis and night terrors. I've experienced a lot of strange things, but like I said, this one was actually pretty cool, and I thought I would share. My grandpa was born in the last years of the 19th century and spent his entire life living in rural Idaho as a farmer and rancher. He has tons of old cowboy stories and he would always tell us grandkids. Most of them were funny, some were cautionary, but a few were downright creepy. When my grandpa was six years old, he, along with his older brother and a gang of kids from the nearby farm, decided to go ice skating for the day. At that time, my great-grandpa was working as a ranch hand and the family lived near Chesterfield, Idaho, 
Now it's mostly a ghost town. It was a bright and sunny January day in 1902, and though the temperature was low, the sun kept things somewhat warm. They had hitched sleighs to their horses and headed down to the Portnoy River to ice skate. There were eight kids all together, and they were excited to show off their new skates for Christmas. Along with my grandpa and his brother, there were the three Robinson kids, Tommy Bear and the Gooch twins. The best spot to skate was next door to the Gooch's ranch. The river there was broad and shallow, so the ice tended to be thicker. And if they did fall through, they would just get their legs wet. The kids spent a couple of hours skating when a loud scream came from a willow bush on the riverbank opposite them. The kids could only watch as a giant man, covered head to toe in thick black fur, came lumbering out of the bushes. It was carrying a large tree branch and was screaming in rage at the kids. They had fled toward the sleighs trying to scramble up the riverbank in their gates. My grandpa, being the youngest, was at the back of the rush. He couldn't get a good foothold because of the skates and he fell backwards toward the ice. The giant was now crossing the river toward them, screaming and swinging his branch. My grandpa was sure that this creature was going to eat him. As my grandpa tells it, Lady Luck smiled down on me that day by the river because as the giant was midway across the river, the ice gave way. It only submerged to its shins, but it slowed down considerably as it tried to get back on top of the ice. This gave my grandpa's brother enough time to jump down and cut the laces off my grandpa's skates. They left the skates and dashed up the river bank and jumped onto the sleigh. As they looked back, the giant man was cresting the river bank. To their relief, it did not chase the sleighs. It just stood there, hollering at the kids, and swinging its tree branch. The kids were able to make it back to the Gooch Ranch where they told their encounter to John Gooch, the twins' grandfather. Word spread quickly in the tiny farming community and soon a posse was formed to hunt down the wild man. Where the kids had been skating, there were footprints, almost two feet in length that the group found. My grandpa's skates were found near the tracks. They had both been bent in half like horseshoes. The tracks headed west into the nearby mountains. The hunting party followed them as far as they could, but deep snow prevented any further travel. The creature was never sighted in that area again. The story captivated the small community and soon word traveled across the country of the Idaho wild man. That spring, my great grandpa decided to buy a ranch in the little lost river valley farther north in Idaho. My grandpa had many other weird and creepy backwoods stories, but he always said that this encounter frightened him the most. He was sure that he would have been killed if that giant hadn't broken through the ice and given his brother a chance to cut his laces. Entities in the house. I lived in the house where all of this took place from the ages of 9 to 23. My parents got divorced when I was 14. I lived with my parents, younger brother, and grandma. My younger brother was the first to notice something strange in the house. One night in 2005, he woke us up at about 11 p.m., crying, saying that there was someone outside his window. Living in South Africa, such things are possible, so my dad went to inspect and found nothing. A few weeks later, my aunt, my mom's sister, came to visit from out of town and was sleeping in my grandma's room. She relayed to us the next morning that she was awoken by the door opening and a figure staring at her from around the corner. Fast forward a few years to 2007 and 2008. I would normally stay alone at home whenever my dad would go out fishing with my brother for the weekend. 
This is when I started noticing odd things happening. Keys would go missing. Lights would be on after I know I had switched them off. Small things, but significant enough for me to take note. 2010 is when things got real. I was in my last year of high school and working part-time for my dad, who has an office on the same property as the house. I was working on a file, left it on the desk, and went to lunch. And when I returned, the file was gone. No one else could have taken it, as the only other staff member was the receptionist. About a week later, we found the file one morning just laying in the middle of the floor. That weekend, a friend of mine stayed over in my brother's room, and we came home from a party. It must have been about one or two in the morning when we got to bed. I was already falling asleep when I heard him scream for me. My room and my brother's room share a bathroom with doors on each side. I get to my friend who is literally sweating and I asked him what happened. He said somebody started to choke him as soon as he closed his eyes to sleep, but nobody visible was there. From that day, I would be seeing the man, as we named him, around the property. I've seen him while working on my car in the garage. I've seen him while doing dishes. My father has even seen him while sitting in the garden. I never see his face, but he's always wearing blue overalls, like the ones construction workers wear. It wasn't serious until I got married and had a kid. This takes us to October of 2019. My son is a year and a half old and he refuses to be in this house. He cries constantly whenever we visit my dad. And as soon as we leave, he's perfectly well behaved. Two weekends ago, my dad had gone out fishing. My brother wasn't around. I had to come feed the cats and switch on the lights. I came in at about 7 p.m. that Saturday night. And as soon as I walked into the house, I felt a chill. Thinking nothing about it, I carried on with what I had to do. While in the kitchen, I heard heavy footsteps in the lounge and the breaking of glass. I rushed to investigate and I found a vase that's normally on the cabinet about five meters away on the floor in pieces. I locked up and got out of there. I told my wife the story when I got home and she suggested that I burn frankincense around the house and read some prayers. Sunday morning, I set out on my mission, and I started burning frankincense and praying around the house. When I got to the office, I had just begun to pray when the glass sliding door shattered. Since then, my son hasn't been fussing when he comes here, and the atmosphere seems a lot lighter around the house. middle school teacher and coach in a rural area outside of San Antonio, Texas. As a part of my coaching contract, I have to get my CDL and bus my athletes to and from games. After our last game of the volleyball season, I was driving the bus back to the bus barn. It was around 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night, so it was already super dark and there weren't many cars out but I've driven this part a million times and I was just excited to return the bus and get home to my husband and dogs. The bus I had wasn't anything special. It was just an old sub bus from 2004. There are cameras inside that don't record audio, apparently, and a few switches were broken. But as long as the brakes worked and the bus got as close to 50 miles per hour as it could, it was perfect. I was approaching a bridge when a whispering voice began to speak through the radio. This didn't surprise me much because there's usually an interference near this bridge due to it being near the train tracks. Plus lots of cops hide here to catch speeders. I wasn't really familiar with the way these radios worked, but it helped me feel better about it. The closer I got to the bridge though, the louder the whisper through the radio was. I began to make out words like slow, sit, 
and no. As soon as I started to go underneath the bridge, I did a mirror check just to make sure I had enough room on the sides. Everything seemed normal, until I looked in the inside mirror that could see all of the seats behind me. Sitting in the very back row on my right was a figure. It was pure black, just a black abyss sitting straight up in the seat as if it was one of my athletes. At first I thought it was a shadow, but as the bus moved, it stayed put, unlike the shadows around it. After about five seconds, as I pulled away from the bridge, the figure vanished. The voice on the radio had paused, but then I clearly heard it say in a static low voice, turn around. I snapped my eyes forward, terrified, and pressed the gas a little harder, praying that I could get this old bus to go faster. The bus bar and gate was open and about 50 yards away, and I only stopped when I parked the bus. I did a quick sweep of the inside to make sure that nobody had stowed away and that this was some kind of prank, but there was nothing out of the ordinary. I asked the other coaches the next day if they had ever had any weird experiences around the bridge, but they said no. I'm going to ask the coaches at the other schools as well. I did get a chance to tell this story to one of the bus drivers that I get to see most mornings during the AM drop-off. He's an older driver who's been around since 2001. He mentioned that gangs used to race down that stretch of road all the time back in the early 2000s. One day, a race ended in a fiery crash just before the bridge, and a young man lost his life. The bus driver had heard similar stories to mine about the radio near the bridge, but never had anybody said that they had seen an apparition before. I asked if he knew of somebody I could contact to see the footage from the camera on the bus, but he laughed and said that they would probably think I was crazy and drug test me on the spot. This was the scariest experience I've ever had driving a bus. I pass that bridge every day on the way to work, and it just gives me chills. I don't have to drive a bus again for another three months, but I'm already dreading it. a resort in the Adirondack for several years. The place is old and rustic. It's miles from civilization and very peaceful. It was built in the 20s and had somewhat of a sordid past. It was built for a Canadian senator who would run rum down from Canada during the Prohibition. We still had the underground locked safe room where he would store the booze as well as hidden booze hiding areas underneath some of the cabins. Calvin Coolidge stayed at a camp across the pond during his presidency and would visit my camp, for the spirits, I'm sure. Anyway, I met a girl and decided to sleep out under the stars on the camp's peninsula. It started to rain, so I suggested we sleep on the screened-in porch of the boathouse, which I thought was a pretty good compromise. So, after we were all set up, it was getting pretty late, about 1.30 in the morning or so. We were laying there and I was all tossing and turning because I'd been asleep and woken up. So I have a hard time falling asleep after stuff like that. We'd been laying there for about a half an hour or so when I hear the bathroom door open in the boathouse. It couldn't have been anything else but that door. I did all the maintenance on those old buildings, and oiling that particular door was on my work list for the next day. I knew exactly what it sounded like. My first thought was that it was my boss, the owner of the camp. She is notoriously nosy and has been known to spy on the staff in their staff quarters. So she was my first logical thought as to who had made the noise. Why she would have been hiding out in the men's bathroom 
in the boathouse for over an hour is beyond my comprehension. I proceed to hear footsteps walking across the boathouse, down the three steps onto the dance floor, and stopping right in front of the door to the screened-in porch. I lay there, just waiting for the door to open and for my boss to call my name. As the minutes stretched out, I started praying that she would open the door, walk away, sneeze, dance the funky chicken, anything. But there was nothing. The rest of the night I stayed up, stiff straight in my sleeping bag. No receding footsteps, no door noises, no nothing. Just my girlfriend, myself, the night, and an empty boathouse. The next morning, my girlfriend, she wasn't at the time, but she was the four years that followed, rolled over to me and immediately asked me about the footsteps the night before. She had also stayed up all night waiting for some other sound to explain those footsteps in the night and heard nothing. She was terrified. We never went into that boathouse again. I unfortunately had to go to the boathouse myself on a daily basis. Everything was cool during the day. At night, I had to turn all the lights in the camp off. This is something I've done every night for the past three years. However, Ever since that, there was always a sense of dread going in there, being alone in the dark in the boathouse. The worst part is that there's this enormous hanging bed in there in front of the fireplace. It was for the former camp owners to take naps on during the day, hung on chains so that the bed could be lifted out of the way for entertaining guests in the evening. Every single night, that bed was swinging. A 175 pound bed swinging on its chains in the darkness of the boathouse. Until my last day at that camp, if I went in at night, that bed was swinging. I actually overheard this on the news a few years back, about a cryptid in Kentucky. It's a feline-like creature, said to look like a mountain lion mixed with some sort of monstrosity. I didn't really think much about it until my friend, we'll call him Bran, told me what he saw when he was deer hunting. It was pretty late and he and his dad were about to pack up. They heard a low growl near them. His dad told him to get back up in the hunting perch. I'm not a hunter by any means, so don't crucify me for not knowing the correct lingo. Bran did and watched through his binoculars to watch for what had made the growl or for his dad to give him an all good. He watched for what he said might have been 10 to 15 minutes when movement caught his eye. He tried to get a better look when he saw the weird creature that I mentioned earlier. It scared him so badly that he froze. He thought it was just a mountain lion or a bobcat, but it had four eyes. His dad managed to distract it off by startling a nearby doe. It left chasing its newfound prey. He and his dad waited until they couldn't hear it and then booked it back to their truck. He was pretty shaken up the whole week after. I felt bad for him. However, this wasn't his only run-in with a cryptid or a strange creature. Despite being underage, he still does a lot of dangerous or stupid things, such as drinking and driving, smoking cigarettes, and other really dumb things. He's not shy about it either. Well, he'd been doing that first one, but wasn't totally drunk yet, and his best friend, we'll call him Dave, was taking a joy ride with him on some back roads, which aren't hard to find in our region. They were messing around, having a good time, blaring music, you know, teenager things. He was focusing on the road, listening to a story Dave was telling him, when he saw a strange, pale, humanoid, quadrupedal, fleshy creature with visible teeth and large black eyes run out onto the road. Bran hit his brakes and just barely missed it. 
It screeched at him and ran off into the woods on the other side of the road. Bran and Dave sat there trying to process what had happened and if what they both saw was real. They stopped drinking and went straight back to Dave's house, where they proceeded to freak out. They told me this story, too, as I sat next to them in a couple of classes. Well, I asked them to describe the creature to me, as I'm known for researching and collecting information on cryptids, urban legends, and monsters, and they felt I could help. After they gave me the description, I came up with a list of possible creatures and showed them art and, quote, real pictures of them on Bran's phone. Once we got to Wendigos, Skinwalkers, and the Rake, they showed clear signs of distress. I pulled up one of the well-known rake pictures and showed it to them. I thought Bran was going to have a heart attack. He yelled, that's it, it has to be, it's almost dead on. Dave scrolled through the related pictures and found a different photo and quietly showed both of us. Bran then fell silent. They both said that that was it. That was the creature they nearly hit. I told them that they had to be bullshitting me because the rake is a creepypasta told them the story and what it's known for, and that they were not proven to be real and were in fact very likely fake, but they insisted that that's what they saw. They thanked me and asked me if there was a way to protect themselves if it came for them. I told them I didn't know, but fire was probably the best route if it actually was real. They haven't had any experiences since that I know of, but it did freak them and me out a good amount. I was glad I could help them. But now I'm terrified of the woods, more than I previously was, and I question more and more if these legends are just legends. I already believed in a few, but it's just terrifying to think that more of them could be real. A few years back, I went camping with two buddies in the mountains near Lake Tahoe. We hiked about two hours with our packs to a small lake and set up camp. All was normal during the day. We made some hot dogs and beans and then stayed up until it was dark to watch the stars. Once it was dark out, we hiked up to the top of a large boulder to get a vantage point to see the stars over the trees. I recall that there was no moon out that night because we could see the stars so clearly due to the limited ambient light. We were pretty far out there, so there was no background noise or light from humans. Once our eyes adjusted after a half an hour or so, we could see all of the stars and even some satellites slowly moving in the sky. After we're done stargazing, we head down to our tents that were set up right by the lake. We have two two-person tents for the three of us. My two friends shared one tent and I was alone in the other. We set up the tents right next to each other on the same flat spot. I fall asleep pretty easily because I was tired from hiking and exploring all day and because it was so dark out and I like sleeping in the dark. However, at about three or four in the morning, I wake up to a rustling on the outside of my tent. In my half asleep days, I'm not sure if it's just wind or something else. I keep listening and I realize that it's something brushing against my tent. It sounds like an animal pushing its nose against the tent fabric and sniffing. The sound is coming from the side of the tent right next to my head so I can hear it super clearly. At this point, my heart is racing and I'm lying frozen in my sleeping bag, hoping that whatever is outside will leave my tent and it'll just be over. I think about calling out to my friends in their tent, but I don't want to startle or anger whatever is outside. So I decide to just keep lying still and hope it will leave. My mind is going through every possibility when I finally realize what it is. When we had set up our tents earlier that day, there wasn't much flat space, so we placed our tents very close to each other, like I said. 
Evidently, they were so close that when my friend was moving his feet in his sleeping bag, they brushed up against his tent, which was right near my head. So all along, it was my friend's feet moving around, and there was no animal or person outside. Phew. However, that wasn't the end of the weird stuff. And I only realized that this next part was weird once we had left the next day and I got home. As I laid in my tent and tried to slow my heart after realizing that the rustling was my friend, I was looking at the shadows of the trees on the wall of my tent. They reminded me of when I was a kid, when a car would slowly drive down your street and the headlights through the blinds would cast shadows that slowly draw across the ceiling. At the time, it made sense to me, and I thought it was just like when I was a kid. Considering that I had just thought a creature was outside my tent, this seemed like nothing. However, as I mentioned earlier, it was a moonless, pitch-dark night. So what could that light have been? It was a very slow drawing light that had the shadows of the trees moving across my tent walls for about five minutes. We were very far from civilization, so there's no way that it was a car or a flashlight from a midnight hiker, because the light was so steady and slow moving. I don't know if it was a flare or a comet streaking across the dark sky or something else. I still don't know what it could have been, and I think maybe I'm okay with that. I've told a story before about living in a flat where this thing that I called the Whistler always came by. I had other experiences in this flat too, and this one thing has to be the worst by far. It's hard to describe the sense of dread and fear that this thing gave off. It honestly felt like my life was at risk, and my whole body would scream to run. Anytime I would hear this thing, I was alone, which, of course, just made it all worse. One night, the dog was barking outside, so I got up and went out to look. As I was looking outside, the dog went back in and left me alone, standing in the dark next to the shed. I soon became aware of noises in the shed, but put it down to the wind. That is, until I moved closer, and I felt a strong sense of dread. I listened to the sound, sounds like a person on all fours scuffling around. I heard it move toward the shed door, so I ran inside and slammed the door. I sat down and tried to tell myself that it was still just the wind. At first, the dread was going away, but then I could feel it building up again. It felt like it was trying to find a way in, moving back and forth along the walls of the house. Then, I suddenly felt it inside the apartment. It had gotten into the kitchen. I'm not quite sure how. The window, maybe. I could feel it getting slowly closer. I was too scared to look behind me into the kitchen, but I managed to jump up and slam the door. I hoped it would leave, and it did. After this, I would hear it sometimes, just scuffling around at night. The alley at the back was dark and smelly so I assumed it liked it. Now this next bit is truly a fault on my own part. I really should have listened to my own gut feeling. It was months later. It was summer and therefore very warm, so I had the back door open. I was on my laptop and it had gotten dark. At some point, I turned the light on and sat back down. I sat facing the back door. My laptop screen stopped me from seeing the bottom half of the door. After a while, I started to hear movement outside and felt uneasy, but I told myself that it was nothing. Yep, I just sat there and told myself I was being stupid. But the feeling grew stronger and stronger, my whole body screaming at me to run. Then our dog comes running downstairs stops in the middle of the room, looks at me, and then goes to walk outside. 
The way she did this was just odd. I pulled down my screen and watched her head toward the back door. As she walked out the back door, there was this thing. Some humanoid figure crouched down by the door. Its skin was dark brown, like dirt and rot, and had texture like it had been burned. It was hairless and skinny, like it hadn't eaten in months. There it was, this thing I had been in fear of for so long, right up against the door frame, trying to make its way inside. The figure twisted its emaciated form round to follow our dog. It was crouched down onto its hands and feet. That's why it was making the scuffling noise. I jumped up and threw my laptop to the floor. I ran upstairs and refused to go back down alone. The stupidest thing was that I doubted myself, and if it wasn't for the dog, then I don't know what would have happened. Her look toward me when she came downstairs. I can only imagine she was wondering why I wasn't running away. A friend told me it sounded like a skinwalker and that Europe does have accounts of such things, but I don't know. I don't know what that thing was, but either way, I'm so happy that we moved. A family member bought this little box with a mirror inside, like a jewelry box, at an antique store. She looked at it and walked about 20 feet away from it, but then was drawn back to the object, looked at it closer, thought it was a great price, and decided to buy it. After bringing it home today, it sat in the garage for a few hours. Later on, she went outside to clean it and wash it out. She brought it into the home into a room near the kitchen and left it there on the table. She took several photos of the object on the table and then immediately went into the kitchen to clean the dishes. While cleaning dishes, she felt an intense force rushing up on her to grab her. She felt the actual pressure on her left side from the disembodied person coming up on her. She heard something make a sound in her left ear she said that she can't remember the exact sound, but when she originally told me, it was almost like a negative, ah. It wasn't a high-pitched yell or anything, somewhere in the middle. It made her jump and made her let out a loud shrieking sound. It was an intense, immediate feeling of panic when it happened, she said. The feeling went away only after telling any negative spirits and energies to leave and that they were not welcome there. She said it out loud several times and in the garage and inside and outside the house. She placed a Bible on the object and held a cross. At first, when it happened, she thought somebody was trying to play a trick on her in the house. The feeling of a male figure, she actually thought it was her husband coming up on her to mess with her, but there was no one around. The closest person was in the bathroom, quite a distance away and another person was on a totally separate floor of the house. After hearing the shrieking and yelling sound she made, the family member in the bathroom quickly came into the kitchen and asked what had just happened. This all happened very quickly, around 5.40 p.m. local time. This is not the first time an object has been purchased, brought home, and then very strange things started happening. For example, an antique wooden clock that was purchased in another state would hang on the wall and had a very solid latch that would keep it closed. We would come down several times in the morning and the clock would be completely open as if somebody had moved it over the latch and opened it up. Sometimes the TV would even be turned on to different screens in that same room, but nobody messed with the clock and nobody turned on the TV. You would even hear people yelling out your name as if somebody was calling for you, but no one actually was. After getting rid of that clock, those issues basically completely stopped. Today's example was the most negative feeling of all the paranormal experiences in this home. But again, things felt much better after telling it to leave and that it wasn't welcome. The other experiences did not feel negative, 
Maybe playful or trickster-like, but nothing negative. However, the name calling out has somewhat persisted or continued on. It's still very infrequent though, off and on. While writing this story, there were several electronic glitches where I wasn't able to write it out. Notepad would scroll up by itself and not let me copy the text I wrote, things like that. And while trying to save images, it froze my computer. Maybe it has nothing to do with this and is just a software issue, but who knows. Update. The object has been donated to the Goodwill. She sent texts to four different people after donating it and included an image of the place that it was donated. The images disappeared or showed up blank or with a note saying that they weren't able to view it. I'm curious as to what your thoughts are as to what's going on here. Any insight, feedback, or comments would be greatly appreciated. I live on a 13-acre property in the area of my state where the suburbs turn to rural farmland. My parents live in the main house near our road, while my fiance and I converted one of the barns on the back half of the property into our house. Our house and another barn are set in a pretty wide clearing and pasture, but beyond that, we are surrounded by woods on three sides. All of this to say, we don't get many visitors out here. From the time we moved into the house almost a year ago, there have been some occasions where I get this inexplicable feeling of terror while outside at night. I've lived in the woods my whole life, including in places far more remote than here, but I have never had this feeling. The woods are my home. In every other place I've ever lived in them, they felt like my woods, but not here. I have repeatedly had the feeling that I am trespassing on someone else's land, someone who is not happy to have me here. The other night I took my dog out for his last walk of the day. So it was pitch black outside of the ring of light cast by the floodlights on the side of the house. As I was walking toward the edge of the tree line where my pup likes to do his business, I heard a sound like someone imitating the hoot of an owl coming from the direction of the other barn, about 30 yards away to our right. I was so certain that it was a human mimicking an owl that I called out, ha ha, very funny, dad. I assumed it was my father closing up the barn for the night and he was taking an opportunity to try to spook me, but no one called back. It was at that point that my dog lifted his head from sniffing all over and froze, staring in the direction of the barn. His hair stood up along his spine and he started to give a low, menacing growl. Now, this dog is obsessed with all people and animals. Everyone is a friend just waiting to be made. I've never seen him act aggressively toward anything even other dogs that have tried to fight him. My dad, especially, is his favorite person on the planet, so there's no way he would have started growling at him. It was my turn for all the hair on my neck to stand up as a cold wave of fear hit me like a brick wall. My dog had stopped right at the edge of where the light met the darkness of the woods. Normally, the light gradually dissipated into the trees, still providing enough visibility to see the outline of trees and shrubs. But this time, it ended with a solid wall of black. Suddenly, I heard the same fake owl sound from only a few feet away, just on the other side of the darkness. My dog jumped and immediately started barking, putting himself between me and the sound. He's only a little guy, so I darted forward, scooped him up, and took off running toward the house. Behind me, I heard the sound again, but this time it had a strange, 
warble to it, almost like somebody was trying to mimic an owl while laughing. The next morning, when I went out to check on the barn, I found the doors had been partially broken off the slide and were swung past each other in the wrong direction, like someone had tried to force them open the wrong way. But there were no signs of anybody, not a footprint, not a cigarette butt, no signs of an intruder at all. I have no idea what was out there that night, but suffice to say, my dog and I stay well within the floodlights when we go out after dark now. At the time that this happened, I was living in Georgia. My home was near Richmond Hill, and I was working as a lifeguard near Hinesville, which is about 45 minutes away. It was the middle of summer, and I had a later shift, ending at around 9 p.m., and I had stayed in Hinesville until about 1 a.m., hanging out with coworkers before heading home. Now to give you some context, at the time I had a four-door Honda CRV. Also, between Hinesville and Richmond, there's pretty much only one road of nothingness, except for one creepy house that, according to some of my friends, was rumored to be a cult house or something where this really weird family lived secluded away from everyone. At night, that stretch of road gets really dark. There's not a lot of traffic or streetlights, and without a moon in the sky or the light of your car, you'd be pretty much blind until sunrise. Well, it was around 1 a.m. and I was heading home. Stupidly, I had forgotten to get gas before I left, and I was close to empty. I was nervous, but I figured I could make it home. I made it about five minutes out of Hinesville before I got the feeling that someone was watching me from the back seat. The feeling was so strong that I slowed down. I know I should have stopped, but there was no traffic except for me. I switched on my phone light and I physically turned around and looked in the back seat and in as much of the trunk as I could see, but it was empty. I turned back around, but the feeling stayed and worsened, like somebody was full on glaring at the back of my head, wanting me to notice them. Because I have the worst luck, at that moment my gas tank light came on and my tank hit the empty mark. I was still 30 minutes from home. At this point, I started freaking out. I can't tell you why I thought this, but I just knew that if I ran out of gas and was stranded on the side of the road, something bad would happen to me. It doesn't seem logical, I know, but it honestly felt like someone or something was in my back seat staring at me with just this incredible hatred and will to hurt me, and if my car stopped, they would get their way. So I did the only thing I could think of. I clenched both hands on the wheel and started praying, just begging God to let me get to my house before my car ran out of gas. Now I know this sounds insane, and maybe there's some kind of weird technical explanation for this, because I don't know much about cars. But I swear, as I was asking to make it to my house, I watched my gas light go off and my gas tank meter go up to a quarter of a tank. I still felt like there was something in my back seat staring me down, but it felt less intense. The drive felt like forever, but I made it back to the town that I lived in, and the minute I passed the sign saying that I was now in Richmond Hill, my meter went all the way back down to empty and my gas tank light came on, and it stayed like that the five further minutes it took me to make it to my driveway. The next morning, I talked to my mother about it. For some reason, she thought the thing in my back seat was my grandpa, who had passed away a year earlier and had Alzheimer's. She theorized that he was coming to check up on me, but had scared me because he was still confused in the afterlife. I really don't agree with that. My grandpa was a very loving person, even when his memory got really bad and he couldn't remember my name, he still remembered me. Rather than saying my name, he said T-Ball, 
because he'd been my t-ball coach when I was really little. Personally, I feel like whatever it was, was attached to the road and was entirely negative. Either way, I never felt it again and my car never repeated the gas tank trick, though after that I started hanging a cross on my rearview mirror, just in case. When I was at art school in 1992, I was preparing for assessments, so I spent three days before the deadline awake and preparing everything at the last minute, which is my preferred style of doing things. I knew the house in which I lived then was haunted, and I hadn't seen anything manifest as such, but many times when I walked past the back door, it would shake as though the handle was being pulled on from outside. When there was no one there, and no rational reason for this to occur at all. That part of the house had a concrete slab as a floor, so the weight of a person crossing it had zero effect on the structure of the back room, so it couldn't cause the door to react in that way. One night, as I was walking past that door, I looked through the kitchen window into the kitchen, and I saw a figure sitting in the middle of the wall, as if defying gravity. After a second, I realized that the person I was looking at was actually me, wearing a blue two-piece suit with a short, neat haircut, grinning maniacally and looking into my eyes with a strange knowing. As I said, I knew the place already to be haunted, and so, when I saw this figure, I was mentally prepared for the door to shake as I passed it. So far, I was not shaken by the sight of this being, as I might have had I not already been experiencing so many spooky things. Having a general interest in the paranormal, I had also researched ghosts, and I knew what a doppelganger was, or a double walker, one that imitates a living being. I was forearmed with this knowledge, and I knew that traditionally, a doppelganger is believed to kill those to whom it appears, over time, through the excitation of a fear within them that gradually weakens its victim through repeated appearances, all of which somehow grant the entity an increasingly proportionate greater strength. And so, I deliberately ignored it as much as possible, and did not stop or react to it at all. Quickly returning to my room upstairs to continue my work, which at that time I was thoroughly obsessed with completing, I tried not to think anything else of it. The fact that I had so much work to do at that time also helped me to ignore this vision, but I kept it in mind as a memorable event to later consider when I would have more time to spare, and I forgot about it for the time being. Inevitably, I handed in my work for assessment and entered into the first weeks of my summer holiday. One day, I took acid and went back to the house and lay on my bed and tried astral traveling to the very edge of the cosmos, to the point where matter expands into the void which exists outside of matter. I had the feeling that I actually got there and was instantly repelled back into my body, but I actually probably ended up just falling to sleep and waking up again, interpreting that as having achieved my goal. A little while later, my lovely, caring mother asked if I would like to obtain some help trying to find a job for the summer. As she was aware, I was a poverty-stricken, dope-smoking art school student living on a small government grant, and she thought I probably needed her help, which was very nice of her. She drove me to the city and we looked through opportunity shops to look for some cheap but nice business-like clothes appropriate for job hunting. Then she paid for me to have my hair cut. At the end of our expedition that day, she dropped me off at home, and I walked in, still wearing the $15 suit that she'd bought for me. Out of vain curiosity, I hurried to the downstairs bathroom mirror to check out my new haircut. Looking at myself in the mirror, it was then that I remembered and realized that with my hair cut short like that, and in that suit, which was a blue two-piece pinstripe, I looked identical to what I had seen sitting in the middle of the kitchen wall that night, just weeks earlier.
I was no more than eight years old when I saw it. Even my sister, who was 10 years old, saw it. We lived with my grandparents at the time, but my grandpa often liked sleeping in the living room because he often wakes up at night to pray at our tiny altar. We don't always close our bedroom door. Basically, the living room was next to our bedroom and our bedroom was next to the bathroom. So we'd see if anybody were to go to the bathroom through our bedroom. One Saturday night, my sister and I stayed up late watching TV in the bedroom. The only light in the house that was on was in our bedroom. My grandpa chose to sleep in the living room again. It was past midnight, so we thought everybody in the neighborhood was asleep. That was until we saw my grandpa walking past our bedroom. We both stared at him until he disappeared from our sight. Of course, who would be scared? It's our grandpa. But for some reason, we had chills because he never came back out. We assumed he needed to go to the bathroom, but we never even heard the door close. And like I said, he never walked back the other way to go back to the living room. What creeped us out was how unusually straight he was walking, as if he was marching, like a soldier, and a bit too slow. It was almost like he was trying to scare us. It was a bit dark, but we knew it was him because of his features, so we called out to him. The first few calls garnered no reply, so we raised our voice so that he could hear us better. This time he came to us, but what shocked us was that he emerged from the living room instead of the bathroom. Note that my grandpa often wears all white clothing when he's at home. It didn't hit us until then that our grandpa was wearing colored clothing that day and not all white. The one that we saw was wearing a white sleeveless shirt and white shorts and was barefoot. So it couldn't have been him. This scared us even more. We asked our grandpa if he had gone to the bathroom just now. He said no, that he was asleep. It was impossible for him to have pranked us because there was no exit through the bathroom. The windows there are barred. We immediately told him about what we saw. He went to check, but saw nothing. We were scared kids. We didn't know what doppelgangers were until then. Our grandpa talked to us about doppelgangers. He said that's probably what we saw, that it was kind of well known in our area, and that if we saw any more, that we should immediately tell the original person about it, because if we don't, then something bad might happen to them. My sister and I never forgot about it. I would also like to share an incident that occurred a few years ago in a different part of my country. I forget the exact details, but it was on the news and all over social media. A young couple was killed in a motorcycle accident. I believe a bus ran over them. But what intrigued everyone was what the townsfolks said. They said that last night they saw the couple riding their motorcycle, wearing the same clothing. But what shocked them was that they were headless. I don't know if it's real or if they were just exaggerating, but the first thought everyone had was doppelgangers. Nobody knew who it was because they didn't have their heads. That was until people recognized the clothing that the dead couple was wearing the next day. Except the couples still had their heads, but their bodies were contorted in various ways. And everyone assumed that that was what the bad omen that the doppelgangers brought were trying to communicate. That story reminded me of what I saw when I was a kid, and I still don't have a decent explanation for either. Last week, my mother stayed at her friend's house in Florida on vacation. Her friend was out of town during that time, so it was just my mom alone in the house. Her friend is a little eccentric and artsy, but I'm not really sure if she is interested in anything paranormal. She does always insist that she doesn't believe in anything, that she's not religious or spiritual at all. 
My mom told me that when she first got to the house, she felt a little creeped out. Her friend is a super neat freak, so my mom believed that she probably had cameras around the house. My mom felt like she was being watched, and there were all these creepy statues and masks everywhere. There were also little artistic looking altars of bone and beads, but her friend is an artist also, so it kind of made sense. The first day in the house, my mom texted me a picture of one of the statues as a joke, saying, this guy guards the kitchen, he really stops the midnight snacking. I responded and we texted back and forth a little before we stopped. The weird thing is, about an hour after we stopped texting, she sent me the photo again with the same text. I ignored it, but then a couple of hours later, she sent it again. This continued at random for the entire length of the night until about 2 p.m. the next day. Finally, I texted her back and I said, cut it out, mom, this is getting creepy. She told me she only ever sent me the photo once. We even compared our messages after she got back into town. However, the really creepy part was when my mom was in the kitchen. She started to get really freaked out and couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, so she turned on her spirit box. That might be the wrong word for it, I'm not sure, but it's a thing that flips through radio channels really fast, and ghosts are supposed to be able to stop it on certain words. She stood there for a long time, not saying anything, and just listening. When her spirit box said, decompose, my mom asked if someone was there, and the spirit box said, Cooper. My mom didn't want to encourage it any further, so she didn't ask any more questions. But then, completely at random, the spirit box said, all alone. My mom turned off the spirit box because she didn't want to hear anymore, and she left the house. She told me at night she would hear footsteps upstairs, even though she was alone in the house, as well as voices and music. But sometimes she wasn't sure if the voices and music were the neighbors or not. She was so scared that she planned an escape route through the back door if she ever heard the footsteps coming down the stairs, but thankfully that never happened. One of the statues stares out at the garden through the sliding glass door. She said she always felt like that one was watching her, even though it was actually turned away from the interior room. The other weird thing about the house is even though her friend said she wasn't religious, she had something called, I think my mom said, Mitsutsas on every single door inside the house. It's something from the Jewish religion. She's not Jewish and even if she was, I think you're only supposed to put them on your front and back door. It's something for protection. I don't quite have all the details, but it was almost like her friend was trying to get protection at every single door. The friend is aggressively hospitable and she's been asking my mom to stay over at her house for a while. Like she'll be upset if my mom visits and gets a hotel. We have theorized that if there is a ghost in the house, maybe it truly is all alone and somehow influences her to desperately want people to stay there. Or maybe it was saying that it knew my mom was there all alone. During my childhood, I had family who lived in Saudi Daisy, near Chattanooga, Tennessee. One of them told me a story of how, as a girl in the 1930s, she had seen the famed Black Track Ghost. When I asked her about it, she told me the story. In the early part of the last century, a beautiful young lady was forced to choose between the pampered life of a well-to-do daughter in Chattanooga and the dirty, boring life at a Saudi Daisy coal mine. She is known as a black track ghost, which is so named based on the scattered coal that's found over the train tracks in the area of the mines. The young lady, who was the daughter of a local Chattanooga doctor, 
decided to marry a handsome clerk at the Saudi Daisy Mining Office. Outraged at the mismatch, the irate doctor disinherited his headstrong daughter. After a few weeks of marriage, though, the young bride apparently grew bored with life with her shantytown clerk and was instead attracted to a rough-and-tumble miner. One night, the mining office was robbed and the clerk was brutally murdered. The unfaithful bride and her miner disappeared and weren't heard from again, at least not in the usual sense. Sometime later, the body of a young, unidentified woman was discovered in a lake in an adjacent county, apparently the victim of murder herself. No connection was ever made to the runaway bride until her image began to plague the Saudi Daisy miners. The first encounter was reported by a hardened coal miner walking home on a bitterly cold winter's night. As the crippled man struggled up the deserted street, he became aware of somebody quickly approaching him on his right. His silent companion, with hair dripping wet and dressed only in a thin white slip, glided past him. Even though he recognized the specter, she stepped by without acknowledging him. The miner was mesmerized, noting that his breath was like a fog in the cold, dark night, while her rigid lips emitted nothing. The black track ghost visits became a common occurrence in Saudi Daisy. When she wore a long, flowing white gown, local residents believed she was just wandering. But if she appeared in her gray slip, which was apparently her death shroud, she foretold doom. If she stood outside somebody's window, a fatal tragedy would befall the unfortunate homeowner. Although the black track ghost is best known in Saudi Daisy, her spirit continued to echo her desire to exist in two worlds. Her father's home was near Walden's, the old Civil War hospital, located near East 8th Street and what is now Martin Luther King Boulevard. The friend that I knew said that she lived in that area as a little girl. The child witnessed the black track ghost many times as she stood and looked sadly into a nearby doctor's home. When the little girl spoke of it, she was slapped and told not to tell lies, but she said that she was only telling the truth. She was just observing the sad shade of a woman who was visiting the comfort and luxury of her father's domain with the knowledge that she could never return home again. Another haunting that went hand in hand with this and occurred simultaneously happened to those living near the coal mining town. They experienced something unique. A pair of glowing eyes would appear in several of the local houses on a fairly regular basis. After a while, nobody was even alarmed. It just became accepted. A young bride got the life scared out of her after waking up to see the ghost roaming her bedroom. Folks just laughed like it was nothing out of the norm. The haunting stopped sometime around the mid 50s though, and nobody's heard from the ghost since. And nobody really knows why. So I live in a city named Oshkosh in Wisconsin, and if you've never been to Oshkosh, there are a lot of older things that are still in use. This is especially true of the schools there, and by this I mean the middle and high schools. Now my mom is a teacher in the Oshkosh area school district and currently teaches at a school named Merrill, which is both an elementary and a middle school and is one of the oldest schools in the city. She has to go there on weekends in addition to the school week every once in a while to take care of extra grading, classroom management, and things like that. A few weeks ago, my sister and I joined her on one of her extra days on the weekend there. And my sister and I have already had some weird stuff happen to us there, such as hearing footsteps out in the hall when we know we're the only ones in the building. My sister had a balloon in the classroom once come down from the ceiling 
and basically chase her. So she and I are already aware of the paranormal tendencies of this place. Anyway, the three of us walk in with me being a six foot one, 160 pound male first, because apparently that makes me the expendable one. And we start walking up to her room, which is on the third floor. Now, it's necessary to mention that her school has limited access to each of its separate areas. So middle school teachers can't easily get into the elementary school and vice versa. It's necessary to mention that because as I walked up to her room, I was struck silent and motionless by a figure that I saw standing in front of me, walking away from me. The figure then turns down the next hall to the left. I turn back to my mom to show her where the figure had turned. She said, well, that doesn't make any sense. That's a dead end hallway. Anybody who went down that way would have quickly noticed this and turned around. Yet, nobody did. We stood there for a short while to see if anybody came back. Nobody ever did. When I say figure, I don't mean some trick of the light. As a lover of the paranormal, I am also at the same time one of the most cold-hearted skeptics you can imagine. Because when I experience something, I want to exercise the possibility of it being anything else before coming to the conclusion that it's paranormal. I have thought of everything, be it a trick of the light, a shadow, something passing over a nearby window, but nothing makes sense to me based on what I saw. The only light emitted in the area was by the overhead lights, which clearly showed a very tall, well-built figure of indeterminate gender or skin color walking away from me. There were no windows nearby to cause an illusion like a passing vehicle. The possibility that it was someone who needed something down a hallway or a janitor needing to clean the hallway had also crossed my mind. So I made my mom question everybody with access to that area during the weekend to see if anybody had been near that section of building, but nobody had. My sister also confirmed that she had seen that figure too, so it couldn't just have been my mind playing tricks on me. This experience sticks out in my mind, but the part that still brings tears to my eyes and raises goosebumps on my skin is the sound that we heard with it. It was like a wail, like a cry, this scream almost. The thing about it is that it was a very windy day and there was wind whistling through the halls of this old building. But then the wind stopped and the screaming continued. It wasn't only the wind. My mom has been in that building a lot of times with wind and without. And she said she had never heard a sound like that before. My childhood was spent in the frosty realm of the Arctic. In my hometown, if the night was clear, it was ordinary to witness a variety of peculiar lights dancing across the sky. The Arctic winters are long, affording us more time to admire the starlit expanse. It's a breathtaking spectacle, provided you can endure the biting chill. I often ventured a few kilometers outside the town on a snowmobile, powered it down, and laid on the snow, enveloped by the tranquility, the only interruption being the occasional whispering breeze. The northern lights, or aurora borealis, were also a frequent sight. Not a daily event, but they occurred often enough to become a part of our lives, unless they put up an exceptionally grand show. One particular night, I decided, without seeking my parents' permission, to take their snowmobile for one of my midnight jaunts. I navigated a few kilometers beyond the town, over the hills, seeking a spot untouched by the town's light pollution. Upon reaching the spot, I switched off the snowmobile and nestled into a comfortable position 
to gaze at the sky and reflect on life. The view was rather ordinary, satellites gliding across, an uninspiring display of magnetic field disturbances, and so on. That's when an odd clicking sound started to manifest. My initial assumption was that it was the snowmobile's engine cooling down, which in the cold contracts and expands quite a bit. However, the sound wasn't emanating from that direction. I then speculated it could be a nearby wild animal, which meant that I had to leave promptly. But the rhythmic nature of the clicking was too regular for any animal to make. The noise seemed mechanical, and more perplexingly, it was coming from above. Naturally, I looked up to identify the source. The scene was familiar. Stars, northern lights, a languid satellite, all ordinary. But before I could disregard it and return home, I noticed something unusual in the Aurora Borealis. There were three distinct points of light, growing increasingly brighter. Initially, I dismissed them as unusually symmetrical stars, but I was mistaken. The clicking sound in my head amplified from a soft pen tapping to the clattering of billiard balls. Then, it all ceased. The lights vanished, the clicking subsided, and except for being somewhat frozen and petrified, I was unharmed. I hopped back onto the snowmobile, wondering if I was losing my mind. It took longer than usual to start the machine, which raised my anxiety, but soon I was en route back to town. Various plausible explanations for the incident raced through my mind. A helicopter from the mine, peculiar behavior of the northern lights and such. I reached home to find it dark. This was odd since it wasn't that late when I departed. I quietly entered the house, shed my winter gear, and found the house eerily silent. With my parents being teachers, they were typically up late, grading papers or watching TV. My goal was to slip into bed unnoticed, which, to my relief, I managed to do easily. I was setting my alarm for the next day, when the reality of the situation hit me. The sluggish engine, the cold stiffness, the empty house during what felt like a brief ride. When I departed, it was nearing 11 o'clock PM, but now I saw that it was almost six in the morning. I had been entranced by clicking lights for nearly seven hours. I didn't sleep that night and I no longer embark on late night snowmobile expeditions. One of my good friends in high school had this lake house. It was given to his parents by their grandparents and they lived in this house from 90 to 93. One day in 1993, his mom woke him and his younger sister up and left the house. It was like two to three in the morning. They went to a restaurant that was open 24 seven and stayed there until sunrise. Then they went home, packed all of their clothing and other important items and left the house. They never went back and his mother refuses to speak about what happened. They still own this property. It has two homes on it and it's lakefront, probably worth millions. The power is still on and his dad comes and checks on it every so often. In hearing this story, of course we went to the lake house. Pulling up, a motion sensor floodlight flicked on and stayed on. We unlocked the deadbolt, which requires a key to open on both sides, and walked in. Instantly, you got that creepy feeling like somebody was watching you. We walked around for about half an hour, walking up the stairs and unlocking another door with a deadbolt on both sides. And man, was it eerie. All the furniture was set up. His sister's nursery was still intact, and a tea kettle was still on the stove. It was just straight up creepy in every way. Finally, we go to leave and we decide to go through the garage. 
I have the keys, and again, you had to have a key to unlock it from the inside. I'm trying to open the door, and I turn around to get a light, just in time to see a rock come from somewhere down the hall and hit my foot. Staring at all three of my friends and not seeing them do anything with their arms or anything else, I decide to try to unlock the door more rapidly. Finally, I find the right key and I put it in the keyhole. As soon as I do, the garage door opens about two feet, and thanks to the motion sensor floodlight that's still on, I can see a chair in the garage. The chair proceeds to be thrown against the wall with a violence that I cannot describe, and the garage door is slammed shut. I turn around to say, let's get out of here, and I see a rock come from the darkness and hit the wall with a lot of force, right next to my head. At this point, I'm done. We run back to the stairs and down to the basement and for the safety of the door that we had come in, the door which requires a key on either side to lock or unlock. We had left that door unlocked and it was locked. Freaking out, we hear what sounds like heavy running footsteps upstairs. I'm panicking to find the key. Finally, I find it and unlock the door. We run to the next door, and you guessed it, it was locked. I again find the right key as the footsteps are getting louder and coming down the stairs. We run out the door, and it gets left open by the last person out. As we go to shut it, it's slammed, and instantly you hear the deadbolt lock. At this point, we're only focusing on getting out of that place. We ran to the truck and all four of us piled in. As soon as the truck started, every light in the house came on at once. My buddies slammed it into reverse and were flying down this very long driveway. And as soon as our tires leave the gravel and hit the pavement, every light in the house turns off, leaving it in absolute darkness. Something very, very bad is in that house. I'm not sure what, but I'll never go back to find out. And I absolutely believe in ghosts or demons now. Believe it or not, this is the short version of the story. The backstory of the house is even creepier. But suffice it to say, I will not be returning. Okay, so I had this experience a long time ago, and it's been something that has driven me crazy ever since. I need to know if this has happened to anyone else, or if anybody knows what it might be. I believe in the paranormal, but I had never heard of anything like this happening to anyone else. So here goes. When I was 10, I was at a friend's house for her birthday party. It was Friday the 13th, but nobody was really that aware of it. Like, nobody thought of the date or anything. Anyway, it was a camp out in her backyard, which is basically in the middle of the woods. When it comes time to go into the tent and sleep, most of the other girls decide that they would rather sleep inside. Except for me and one other girl, we decided that we wanted to sleep in the tent outside. So the rest of them all slept inside while this other girl and I were outside. The birthday girl's dad slept in a separate tent right next to ours. The girl and I were talking, and then for some random reason, I asked her what the date was. She said, oh, it's Friday the 13th. We both kind of paused for a minute, thinking it over, and we both just kind of said, whatever, that's just a myth. Remember, we were still young, so while we had heard that Friday the 13th was bad luck and stuff like that, we hadn't really seen any scary movies, and we weren't informed about all the bad things that happened on that day. To us, it was a campfire story. Anyway, we don't give it another thought, and eventually, we go to sleep. This is when things took a turn. I am a very heavy sleeper, but I was woken up in the middle of the night. I have no idea what time it was, 
We didn't have cell phones yet, but I think it was somewhere between midnight and 3 a.m. I woke up because I heard this deep, menacing laughter. It honestly sounded evil. I sat up and it immediately stopped. I thought I must have just been dreaming, so I went to go lay back down. As soon as my head hits the pillow, it starts again. It's an extremely low man's voice, just going, ha ha ha. I wake up my friend from her deep sleep and ask her if she's hearing it. She sleepily says no. She said she didn't hear anything and she fell right back asleep. I brushed it off once again and once again I tried to go back to sleep. But as soon as I laid my head on the pillow, it started up. I noticed that every time I heard it, it got louder, as if it was getting closer. I tried one more time to go back to sleep, but this time it was so loud, it sounded like it was 10 feet away. At this point, I wake up the girl and tell her we're going inside. She's tired, so she said she's gonna stay out there. I wake up my friend's dad from his tent next to ours, and I tell him that I wanna go inside. He woke up and escorted me inside where I was finally able to fall back asleep. I tell everyone the next day what happened and they all tell me that I'm crazy. But when I talk to the other girl who was in the tent, she tells me that after I left, she started hearing it too and that she would swear by it. Whenever I tell people this story, the first thing they say is that it was the dad messing with us, but I'm certain that it wasn't. I knew this guy very well, and he just isn't that type of guy. He's very plain and very quiet. I had known him a long time, and I've never seen him act differently. The other reason I know that it's not him is because the entire time it was going on, I could hear him snoring from his tent. So, it definitely wasn't him. I've never been able to get that evil laughter out of my head. Ever since that day, I've been afraid of the dark, and I've always felt like something is watching me. I suffer from sleep paralysis from time to time now, and whenever I do, I hear the laugh. This was 10 years ago, and it still haunts me. One night, in the spur of the moment, my best friend, my girlfriend, and I went camping on the banks of a creek that I lived within five miles of. We grabbed a 20-pack of beer, some blankets, and some cigarettes, and headed out in my piece-of-shit van with good spirits. It was about a week to ten days before Halloween, so it got dark on us pretty quickly. We made haste and gathered firewood with flashlights, ignited a fire, which rapidly grew hot, and threw off a lot of light, which allowed us to gather enough wood to chill and drink a couple of beers. We broke out the boom box and commenced having a good time. A few hours went by very quickly, and my girlfriend went to the van to sleep, although I don't know how, as it was pretty cold away from the fire. Anyway, my friend's girlfriend got off work at midnight and brought us more beer, though we didn't need it, as we had only drank about half of what we had initially brought. Those two got in an argument and she left. We watched as her taillights faded into the night. Then the weird stuff started happening. This place wasn't in the middle of nowhere. It was secluded, but we could see farmhouses from where we were. It was far enough tucked out and cold enough where nobody would be screwing around anywhere near us. All of a sudden, my buddy goes, screw that woman, and turns up the radio as loud as it would go, but not for long. It was about that time that I heard what he was talking about. A distinct woman's voice from across the creek scream in a guttural way, help me. I looked across the fire at my buddy to see him look as pale and sheepish as I felt. He turned down the radio before I could say anything. Dude, did you hear that? He said. He grabbed his cell phone and we both grabbed flashlights and shined them across the creek. He called his girlfriend to make sure she didn't have car trouble down the road. She was already home. That was like a relief and more stress at the same time. It wasn't her, so who the hell could it be? 
We stood there in the grip of fear. Lights shined across the water. We didn't hear anything for what seemed like forever. Just when we were about to chalk it up to imagination or jitters or something, we hear, help me. A woman that couldn't have been a hundred yards away from where we were standing, which was right on the opposite bank of the creek from where we were. We quickly shone our lights to where the plea for help was coming from, but there was nothing there. We both called out, hello, where are you? Hello? No response ever came. Being experienced in the outdoors, we both knew that if she was being attacked or chased, there would be other noises we could hear, like rustling in the fallen leaves, or as close as it sounded, some more cries for help or twigs snapping or something. By this time, whatever buzz we had from the beer was long gone. We began gathering whatever we could grab and I woke up my girlfriend and commanded her to start the van and that we were leaving. She promptly did this and it's probably a good thing that she did because what came next still scares me to this day and is completely unexplainable. As we were piling in, we hear, help me, come from the very back of the van, which was in the complete opposite direction of where the screams had been coming from. Needless to say, we left the beer and radio and got out of Dodge. I had my girlfriend get out of the way and I burned out, nearly wrecking the car in the process. I drove the dirt road about 60 all the way out. This happened in October of 2002 and I can't reconcile what it was. I tried saying that it was maybe coyotes or foxes. They make a yipping bark and a really scary scream respectively. There aren't any mountain lions within 500 miles of this place, so it wasn't that either. But whatever it was spoke, and to my knowledge, none of those things do. Whatever it was, it scared two 21-year-olds into leaving a case of beer behind. Honestly, I don't think I wanna know what it was. Although, I think I have a pretty good idea. This is an experience I had a few years ago, which made me a believer in the paranormal. I hope you find it as interesting and creepy as I did. I went out very early in the morning, about 5 a.m., to take photos in the forest. I've always liked the vibe of the forest, especially during early mornings, since it has a kind of calmness to it. I live in central Sweden, where we have many deep forests everywhere. Much of it is untouched. Think plenty of moss and old growth trees. This particular forest I went to was quite near my home. However, since I lived in the countryside, I was very alone with no other soul around. During this morning, there was also fog lingering in the treetops from the surrounding rivers which looked really cool to be honest, so I was very ready to go take some awesome photos. I went into the forest after parking my car along the road that went beside it, and I started walking straight in. After maybe a hundred meters, I stopped to take some photos, mostly of dead trees and mushrooms and things like that. I was 20 and I felt very artsy. After a few minutes, I started hearing knocks on the trees. Probably a bird, I thought, since we do have woodpeckers around here. So I didn't think that the sound was too unusual. The strange thing is that I started looking for it since it came from a tree that was right beside me, but I couldn't find it. Unlucky, I thought. I wanted to see if I could get a nice photo of the bird, but I decided to move on. I continued walking into the forest when I noticed something. The knocking or pecking seemed to follow me as I walked. It continuously knocked on the trees closest to me. At this point, I still didn't think too much about it, but that would change after a while. I stopped at a spot that looked really nice to set up my camera on a tripod in an attempt to maybe snap some cool photos of the surrounding area and treetops. 
I sat down and continued to hear this knocking on a tree just a few meters behind me. At this point, I started to feel a little weird about it, since I had started to notice how it followed me. A few seconds later, while changing my camera settings, I suddenly heard several very loud and very clear heavy footsteps behind me that rapidly approached until they were right behind me. My whole body froze. I have not until this day experienced chills like that through my whole entire body. After what felt like several seconds, I flew up and spun around to what I thought was going to be some kind of a big animal, but nothing was there. For context, besides a few trees, this area was not particularly dense. Just a few trees here and there, but mostly moss and grass, like a clearing. I picked up all my things and started walking quickly back toward my car. And that's when the knocking started again. It followed me again, and I just knew that something was mocking me. Feeling a little silly, I said, I'm leaving, okay? I knew that whatever it was didn't want me there. I continued to hear the knocking until I came back to the spot where I first started hearing it. And then it just stopped. I, on the other hand, did not. I went straight back to my car and I went home. Before this, I was pretty skeptical about the paranormal, but this really changed my views. Since then, I've only had one other experience that I consider paranormal, but this is the one that scared me the most. This is a true story that happened to me, which I am weary to share, as there have been many times where I have opened up about this, only to be met with ridicule. I hope you'll take this seriously, because I do. Back in 2008, my girlfriend and I decided to go to an abandoned mental asylum off Highway 82 in Alabama, called Old Bryce. It shut down a few years back due to malpractice, and some of the ghost legends, like the number two ghost, involve murder by staff at the facility. Essentially, this was a dumping ground for people that society didn't know what to do with. Thousands of people were sent there and died there. The facility consisted of four buildings, Bryce, the residential hall, S.D. Allen, the medical facility, the crematorium, and the guard shack. I have seen two ghosts in the residence hall, the bigger of the two, I will share with you now. My second visit to Old Bryce was strange. It was my first time inside the building, and I came prepared. It was my girlfriend, me, and our friend Chris. I had a flashlight and a DVD camcorder. Through the main entrance is a staircase on the right, which zigzags up to the second floor, complete with anti-side fence at the top. Make a left, then another left, then a quick right, and you're in the hall that led to the children's corridor. I had the flashlight in my left hand and the camera in my right, scanning, trying to catch something. On the left, at the entrance to that room, there was a bathroom with only a tub in it. I thought I saw something in the bathroom and shined the light that way. Nothing. I moved the camera and the light, thought I saw it again and shined it back. Nothing. Our night continued and finished without incident. The next day I reviewed the footage. In that bathroom, I shined towards something I thought I saw, and I was right. When the light pans to the right, a bluish-white illuminated little girl's face peers out from behind the door to follow the light. As the light shines back in her direction, over the course of two frames, she is half behind the door, and in the next frame she's gone. My heart felt like an ice cube ran through it. I was in such shock. I proceeded to show everybody that I knew. 
The girl's appearance was that of a younger girl, maybe younger than 10, hair parted in the middle, unusually large forehead, and some apparent deformation or disorder. I made the mistake of leaving the camera at a friend's house overnight, who apparently was not my friend because he stole it. I know, I know, but it's the truth. This is where it gets weirder. Two and a half years later, I was living in a different city. One of the legends of old Bryce is that the windows grow back. If you do any damage to them, they'll just grow back over and spirits will follow you home. Well, I broke a window. I was laying in bed one night at about three or four in the morning. I was on the verge of sleep, aware of where I was and very comfortable. Out of nowhere, this immobilizing tingling sensation started at the tips of my toes. I was laying on my stomach with my arms under the pillow, completely helpless as this sensation crept its way slowly up my legs, midsection, and eventually my entire body over the course of about 20 seconds. Once it fully covered me, I heard the whisper of a little girl directly in my ear say, I'm in your room. It gave me shivers. And for some reason I said out loud, I love you. The feeling stopped and it left me on the verge of tears. I don't know what possessed me to say that, but it was really emotional and terrifying. It may or may not have been that little girl from the asylum, but according to the legend, it makes sense. Either way, it's the most terrifying thing that has ever happened to me. This story happened three years ago, when I was 15. It happened in my village. I don't tell this story much because people tend to think that I'm making it up, but I've been thinking of it quite a lot this week and I just wanted to share it. My village is located in a rural area that is protected by the government because it has been considered a natural paradise for the last 30 years. This means that exploration in this area is quite difficult nowadays since it is forbidden to cut trees, which means that it is a huge forest. I was spending my summer there, and my favorite thing was to go hiking, although I had never gone into the woods alone, just on roads with people. My grandma had told me the cleaning services had opened and rehabilitated a path that had been covered in bushes and trees for the last 30 years because of a race that was being prepared, like runners and stuff. Usually I'd go to the nearest town about an hour away on foot by the only way that I knew, the road. On my way back from seeing friends there, I took the new path that my granny told me was safe. I went alone. That was a mistake. The first part of the path was the easiest, just too many obstacles and landslides, but it was nothing compared to the rest. The second part was a hill full of rocks that was the hardest thing to go up. Literally, I had to climb up on my arms and legs like a dog. When I got to the top, I looked around and found some animal bones. I didn't pay much attention to it since the area is known for its big population of wolves and bears that go out at night. I continued my way faster than before. This part was plain floor, where the woods really begin, so it was a relief when I got to a dead end. Some huge trees had fallen exactly on a row on the path, and it was impossible to cross them. This seemed really off to me, because there were no other fallen trees. The weirdest part? Beside those trees, there was this little barn. Yes, a barn in the middle of the woods. I thought to myself that it was probably abandoned. It looked like it. So I decided to throw my bag into the little field that belonged to the barn, and I crossed the fence. I crossed it running without realizing the most bizarre thing. The field had no trees. It was clear, no bushes, no big plants, nothing. It really shouldn't be like that if it was abandoned and nobody had been able to cut anything down there for years. 
I started feeling concerned about how the location of the fallen trees was so coincidental, how there casually was this barn beside a clear field when the path had been closed for 30 years. It just seemed really off. I went on, and luckily, I was reaching the last hill that my grandma had described, the one that connected with the village. Suddenly, there was a moment of silence in the woods. Absolute silence, which allowed me to hear some branches cracking behind me. I thought to myself it was probably a bird or something, but they came closer, and they sounded like footsteps. After trying to convince myself it was probably just an animal, I was way too afraid to look back. I started walking faster. And guess what? So did the footsteps. I just took off running after I noticed that, and so did the footsteps. At this point, I was running for my life. Suddenly, I started to hear incredibly loud grunts. Everything was going really fast. Luckily, I got to my village in a minute or so after that. I got onto the patio of the first house I found and closed the door. It was a relative's house. No need to call the police. I stayed there for ten minutes until I got my breath back, and then I went home. I get chills just from remembering the place, not having a signal in the middle of nowhere. And the grunts. It makes me think there was something following me since the barn and the trees were just a distraction to slow me down. I never went into the woods alone after that. I had moved into a new apartment with a roommate who was related to a friend of mine. This apartment was located on the opposite side of town and I was not familiar with this area when I moved there. A lot of these apartments were literally newly built, but a lot of the lots around the area were still being developed, and it was a very desolate part of town. Most of the area, before construction began, was large amounts of old farm areas that were unkempt and no longer lived on. I am very sensitive to the paranormal, and during this time, I was just beginning to understand why there was so much paranormal energy around me. My fear was literally a beacon, as my aunt explained to me. The very first event I experienced after moving into my new apartment happened within a week. At the time, I didn't have my own car, and besides getting rides from friends, I mostly had to take the bus to get to work. The bus stop that I had to walk to was pretty far away from the apartment complex. There was a lot of new construction everywhere on that road in front of the complex, but there was a gas station and a very small shopping plaza that was mostly empty, except for a bank and a small mom and pop grocery store. I used to sometimes stop at this grocery store and get some Starbucks iced coffee before walking to the bus stop. One very early morning, I want to say maybe around 5.30 a.m. I was walking to the bus stop. I had my earbuds in and I was just walking along, not really paying attention to my surroundings. Suddenly I got a very cold chill up and down my spine and I got the distinct feeling that someone was walking behind me. I turned around, but nobody was there. I got a little nervous and left one of my earbuds out just to keep myself a little more alert. I continued walking and was almost to the shopping plaza when I heard running footsteps behind me. I turned around again and even though I continued hearing the footsteps and was totally frozen in fear, I didn't see anything. I couldn't move a muscle and then I heard something rustle in the bushes next to the sidewalk very close to me and the footsteps stopped. I caught my breath and for some reason the energy that I felt was not a positive one. So I decided to sprint to the little grocery store in the plaza. I calmed myself down long enough to walk over and buy what I needed. 
Then I realized I had at least another seven to eight minutes to walk to get to the bus stop. As I near the door to leave the store, in the parking lot, I see as clear as day a figure of a man that seemed like he was standing in his own fog. I honestly couldn't tell any of his features, but as soon as he seemed to realize that I saw him, he vanished before my eyes. I looked around to see if maybe anybody else had seen it, but it was 5.50 a.m. at this point, and no one was in the store with me except for the person at the register. I gathered my courage and forced myself to walk to the bus stop. As I'm waiting for the bus to arrive, I again started to feel a shiver, and my heartbeat quickened. I got up from the bench where I was waiting and began to look around, but I couldn't see anything. Then, I swear as I breathe, I heard directly in my ear the voice of a man say, I'm sorry. As I'm typing this story out, I literally have chills just remembering the sound of his voice. I instantly knew that it was the figure I had seen in the parking lot. I stood there so freaked out, almost in tears, and the bus finally came to get me. After this happened to me, I paid my friend to drive me to work for the next two months. A lot of other weird things have happened, but this tops the list. I distance hike when I can. Sometimes this means getting up early or staying out late to get as many miles in as possible. Sometimes walking in the pitch dark with a low light headlamp gets spooky. I grew up in the woods of this area. I've slept under the canopy of stars more nights than I can count. I've trekked thousands of miles of trail, riverbank, lake shore, ridge bottoms, bogs and creeks. I've hunted the game. I'm establishing this because it's important that you understand that I have heard, seen, and smelt about all this region has to offer in the way of wilderness. My scariest experience, though, happened at about 4.30 in the morning. It was late spring, so the first morning light wouldn't be visible in the treetops for another 30 to 45 minutes. Another hour passed that until sunrise. I was on mile five. I'm in a low bottom that's wedged between two steep ridges. The trail I'm on was narrow, muddy, and completely hemmed in by thick underbrush, young maple, and old oak growth. I'm focused on the small light from my headlamp, just one step after the other, zoned out. Then I heard a loud crack, and I froze solid. This is the part I have trouble describing. 4.30 in the springtime means I'm the only thing making noise. No birds chirping, nothing dead quiet. Mid-step, I froze. When fight or flight kicks in, you have these immediate instinct thoughts. The thought that instantly flashed in my mind as I stood there, balancing myself into silence was, if I hear that again, I'm turning around and going back the way I came in a hurry. Why? Because that sound was not a branch breaking. It wasn't deadfall. It wasn't a widow maker. I was sure that I had just heard something intentional. Hearing it twice? Well, that meant to get out of there. To describe it as best I can, it sounded like a decent-sized wooden stick being violently whacked against a small tree. More a fungo bat-sized stick than a baseball bat. The distinction in my head being that this sound was a crack, not a thud or a thump. I've described it in the past as explosive because it was so terribly loud and sudden. I had the sense that it was about 50 yards directly in front of me, and it was loud and clear. Now as I stood there, completely spooked, I realized the soon-to-be worst part of my situation. I knew where the sound had come from, and I knew where the trail went. In about 30 yards, I was going to come across a 180-degree turn and start up the ridge going away from the creek. This meant that as soon as I got the courage to move toward the noise, I was going to have to turn my back to it and get up that ridge. This made me very nervous. 
My head is somewhere between there's a murderer and there's Bigfoot, and I really didn't know which. Minutes pass. I just breathe the foggy breath and listen. Nothing. Dead quiet. I've got about 20 to 30 minutes until first light, so I crank up the headlamp and start to slowly creep toward that turn. When you wear a headlamp in the woods at night, every tree branch in front of you casts a big black moving shadow on the trail. That didn't help. I get to the turn and quickly make the bend. I'm moving pretty fast at this point, trying to be quiet, taking tiny shallow breaths so I can listen, and then I smell it. A stench hits me that I can't describe. I just imagined wet, rotten death. I've actually worked scenes where humans have expired in a past life as a firefighter. This was like days old decomposition, but it just smelled strange. I kept walking, fast. By the time I made the top of the ridge, I was huffing and puffing, and the first light was showing. I didn't stop moving until full light was out and the birds were chirping. I've heard it all in the woods. I've smelled it all. I'm telling you, I don't know what that was. Deadfall, and especially leafed out branches, make a lot of noise on the way down. I've heard that many times. This wasn't that. But what it was, I don't know. From 2013 to 2019, I worked in outdoor education at many different summer camps and outdoor education centers in Canada. Mostly Ontario, but I did spend a season in the Rocky Mountains. Having grown up going to sleepaway camp and eventually participating in month-long leadership programs with backcountry canoeing components, I was well prepared to lead a group of teen girls from a camp in Georgian Bay on a two-week camping trip in the Temagami region during my first year as a counselor. The Temagami region is located between North Bay, Sudbury, and Timmins, Ontario. This region is home to many provincial parks, wonderful hiking and canoeing routes, and the Bear Island Indian Reserve. Our route was fairly typical and beginning in the Whitefish Falls region, ending at Highway 11 after 14 days of paddling portaging, hiking, and campfire making. We had a satellite phone to check in with our camp director every day, and in case of emergency. We also had multiple exit points along the route. Until our second to last night, we were having fun and a relatively uneventful time, other than some mild dehydration and the usual bumps and bruises. Near the end of our trip, we were doing some free camping on the shore of an uninhabited island in Bear Lake, which is recognized as part of the Bear Island Indian Reserve. It's a beautiful area, and we were across from the main island that the majority of the 250-person population inhabits. We had put out the fire and gone to bed, when about an hour after falling asleep, I was jarred awake by the sound of a loud motorboat. Obviously, this isn't that weird, because it's a large lake, and many people use boats to reach the mainland or their homes on secluded islands. However, it was around 11 p.m., and things had been quiet for the last few hours. The motor cut out, and I could clearly hear the sounds of an argument. It sounded like at least one man and a woman, and they were very angry and yelling at each other, although I couldn't hear anything specific because they were too far offshore. Suddenly, the woman screamed, and I heard a splash in the water. And then, total silence. At this point, I was pretty freaked out and hoping to God that my girls hadn't woken up. But I wasn't that lucky because I could immediately hear talking from their tent and I could tell that they were scared. I was about to unzip my door and look out to see if maybe the boaters had had an accident or something when the whole tent lit up. The light slowly panned across me and on to the tent my girls were in, which immediately made them quiet. In a normal volume, I was able to tell them to stay absolutely still. 
the light panned back onto my tent and then over to theirs again. I can only guess that it must have been some sort of boat with a searchlight on it. After an eternity that was really only about five minutes, the light was turned off and I heard the motor engage and fade as the boat went away from us. I immediately found the satellite phone and called our camp director, who gave us the phone number for the local police. I called them and they said that they would forward the information that I had given to the local native detachment on Bear Island. I don't think any of us slept that night, and I got up at 5 a.m. to take my canoe out and take a look around. I thought maybe somebody had fallen overboard and had managed to swim ashore. Obviously, I didn't find anyone, and there was nothing floating in the water either, although it is a pretty deep body of water. None of us wanted to camp one more night, so I called the camp and had them head out to the pickup point a day early. We paddled like hell and didn't really talk much. I think that none of us wanted to speculate about what we might have heard, and what might have happened if we had made a noise or moved when that light was on our tents. I've thought about this a lot over the years, but whenever I've told people the story, they've been quite skeptical. I recently started looking into missing person cases in the area, but without much luck. Regardless of what we heard, something bad happened that night, and I'm just glad that nothing bad happened to us. Bruce's castle and cave on Ratlin Island is full of countless ghost stories and legends from local fishermen, hikers, and tourists. The island was a known sanctuary and hiding place for centuries until Sir Francis Drake and Sir John Norrie overtook the island and castle. Those living on the island quickly surrendered, but Norrie's forces slaughtered the helpless 400 civilians and 200 castle defenders, including the sick, old, and young. Today, the castle is in ruins. People have reported hearing screams and cries coming from the old site. A ghostly figure of a man in old leather armor is often seen guarding the castle perimeter before he vanishes. One spirit attempts to interact with people. She is the brown lady and walks the castle grounds and approaches visitors as if she is trying to speak, but she never says anything before fading away. The cave on Ratlin Island is believed to be the most haunted place in Northern Ireland. It is thought to have been bewitched long ago by the pagans who first inhabited the island. People report hearing moans and whispers coming from deep within the cave. Legend says that the Scottish King Robert the Bruce and his men hid in the cave from the English after a brutal defeat, waiting for their forces to regroup during the First War of Scottish Independence. Robert the Bruce eventually defeated the English and was recognized as the true King of Scotland. According to local folklore, the King never died, but he and his men returned to the old cave and entered into an enchanted sleep, waiting until the day they will awake and unite the people of Scotland to defend against those who attack it. Recently, a group of fishermen settled into the cave to take a break and to make tea. As they gathered and poured their cups, a hand appeared out of the darkness and placed an extra cup out to be filled. The fishermen quickly poured their mysterious guest a cup, but were too afraid to look up and see what was lurking in the darkness. The hand disappeared back into the depths of the cave with its cup. Fairies regularly travel from Ratland Island to Bally Castle, where you will find another old haunted castle overlooking the sea which has been turned into a hotel. Balligally Castle is over 400 years old and is haunted by three very active spirits. The most well-known is Lady Isabella Shaw, the wife of Lord James Shaw, that only wanted a son so that he would have a proper heir. When Lady Shaw finally gave birth to a son, Lord Shaw took the baby from her and locked his wife in a tiny room at the top of the castle. One report says Isabella grew restless and possibly went insane in the room. She finally tried to escape, 
only to fall to her death. Others said that Lord Shaw, or someone he hired, threw Isabella out of the window at the top of the castle. Now, Isabella roams the castle in search of her baby. Guests hear strange noises, witness a mysterious green mist, and sometimes smell the old vanilla scent the lady was known to wear. She is most often seen in the tiny old room she was imprisoned in. Today, it has been fittingly named the Ghost Room, which guests can stay in if they so choose. Madame Nixon lived in the hotel during the 19th century and is thought to be the second ghost that roams the castle at night. Guests often report mysterious footsteps and glimpses of a phantom woman wearing a silk dress roaming the halls. The sound of a child running around, playing and laughing is often heard around the castle grounds, even when no guests have children with them. The restless child is known to play pranks on guests and staff. He loves to knock things over, unfold sheets and towels, so that unsuspecting staff will open locked rooms, only to mysteriously find them in disarray. Apparently, a medium stayed at Ballygally Castle, and one night she detected, quote, more spirits than there were guests staying in the hotel. When my dad was little, he used to spend a lot of time at his grandmother's. She lived up in the mountains, and she was one of those people who just took care of everyone. He said that he lost count of all the times that drunks or people on drugs would come in at all hours of the night, and she would always feed them, let them rest, and then send them on their way. She was a kind person, but also one who, what you see, is what you get and she wasn't afraid to tell you what was on her mind. He said that he grew up not being scared of much because of her, and he thought the world of her. But there was one event that happened to him in the woods that scares him to this day. It's one of the reasons that he barely hunts or scouts alone, if he can help it. He was about 17 or 18, and he had stayed with his grandmother so that he could go deer scouting the next morning. The next day, he gets up early and heads out. My dad has a good sense of direction, but for some reason that day, he got turned around and lost in the dense forests of the mountains. He walked and walked, and night fell, with him still clueless on whereabouts he was. Tired, frustrated, and a little uneasy, he stopped to take a break and sat down. He said that it was just pitch dark, so much so that his little flashlight didn't give him much light at all. He was thirsty and starving, and he just wanted to get back to his grandmother's. As he sat there, thinking about where to go, he heard heavy footsteps and twigs snapping behind him. This scared him at first, thinking that he might have come across a bear. He stood up, knowing that if it was, he needed to get the hell out of there, but to not be hasty about it, so as to spook it. He just starts calmly walking away, hoping that he was going in the right direction this time. But the footsteps followed him. They were extremely heavy, thudding behind him a distance away. But as he walked, he noticed that they were speeding up. My dad starts walking faster, and as you can guess, the footsteps become faster. In a short time, he hears them now maybe a couple of yards behind him. Scared out of his mind, he turns around and shines his little flashlight to see nothing except these huge hoof prints. In their wake, the grass was dead and everything around it was dying with each step. He starts freaking out and straight out sprints, not caring which way he's going. He just wants to get as far away from whatever that is as possible. The footsteps behind him are following suit, sprinting after him. He only glances back once more, still seeing nothing but giant hoof prints and dead grass, leaves, and things like that wherever they had landed. 
By now, he's not sure how long or how far he's been running when he sees lights in the distance. He runs toward them, hoping that somebody can help him if he's come upon a house or a store. He breaks out of the woods and joy floods over him when he sees that it's his grandmother's home. She's sitting on the porch. The lights outside are on. His grandmother was a religious woman, so she was reading her Bible at the time. It's embarrassing for him to admit now, but he said that he started screaming for her, tears falling down his cheeks, and she stands up and looks behind him. That's when she sees the hoof prints and hears the sounds herself. She holds her hand out to him, and he grabs onto it tightly. She pulls him to her and then says loudly, You can't have him. He said that the silence that lingered after that was intense. He had buried his head into her shoulder, so when he looked up, all he could see were the hoof prints and the dead grass and leaves. She just held on to him as he cried, whispering to him that he was okay and that it was gone. He has no idea what was after him that night, and he doesn't want to know, but he's pretty sure that his grandmother saved his life that night. I'm from California, and way back when I was on the college search, I realized that I'd likely get to the East Coast if I wanted to play field hockey. My mom and I organized a road trip through Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island to hit a bunch of different schools in a short amount of time. One of the schools was Ithaca College. It was a last minute decision to stop there, so we didn't have much time to explore the general area afterwards. We had been told by multiple people that the waterfalls in the area were beyond gorgeous and worth the stop so my mom and I decided to swing by one before we left for Pennsylvania. We put Ithaca Falls in our rental car GPS and it brought us to this red curb loop and an old run-down overlook of the falls. This overlook was down a hill and through some trees, so my mom didn't want to leave the car on a red curb. She encouraged me to go down and check it out on my own, and I did. The first time I went down, I was sure to be observant of everything around me. I didn't want any randos in the woods sneaking up on me. I went to the ledge and took some pictures, sat and listened to the water for a while, and then turned to go back up. When I turned, I got this odd feeling, as if somebody was watching me or standing with me. I got uncomfortable and looked around. Nothing appeared to be wrong, so I calmly headed back up the hill. I got in the car, showed my mom the photos, and realized that I didn't take any video. My mom suggested that I go back down to get a video since we had time, so I did. The second time I go down, I feel a little less happy. I was down a slope, so my mom couldn't see me. I felt more alone and exposed than the time before, and that sinking feeling kept growing. I got to the edge, took the video with shaking hands, and now I'm feeling like I need to get out of there. I had an intense sense of urgency. I turned around to go back up, and some force stops me dead in my tracks. I'm frozen there, like a rabbit or a deer frozen in headlights. I literally cannot get myself to move forward or take a step. An overwhelming sense of dread sweeps over my body and presses on my chest. Just such dread. I literally feel like I'm going to die. I still can't move and I sit there terrified as I feel a massive presence come up behind me. This thing felt big and so real, but I couldn't get away. I'm still stuck and helpless. I keep standing there, too scared to turn around, unable to move, when the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Whatever this thing was, it bends down toward me, and right next to my ear, it says, 
You who I kid you not. When I heard that, I ran faster than I have in my entire life. I tore up that hill, still too afraid to see what was behind me. I got in the car, slammed the door, and just like in a movie, I went, drive. My mom looks at me in disbelief and goes, is everything okay? I said, just drive. She told me later that I was pale and the sense of urgency in my voice told her that she had to get away from whatever I was scared of. What spooks me so much about this story is that I never turned around. It felt so real that it could have been a person, but I was standing right against the overlook. I don't think anybody could have snuck up behind me. And I've also gotten that sense of dread visiting other haunted places. I really feel like it was something paranormal. As for the Yuhu, it didn't sound male or female. It did sound mean though, as if it was trying to scare me or intimidate me. I've had a few paranormal experiences, but this one certainly takes the cake for the scariest. I hope all of you enjoy, and I'd love to hear your thoughts as to what you think this was. Here are several odd encounters that I've had. Please tell me what you think they are, or were, and your thoughts on them. All of these occurrences have happened near the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. Not near Navajo land, of course, but I was hoping that I could be pointed toward the right information as to whether or not I encountered a skinwalker, or if there's some kind of Eastern cryptid that is similar. Number one. As a child, I used to be really interested in the supernatural. I constantly read about werewolves and vampires, but not about other cryptids, such as skinwalkers and wendigos, until recently. I grew up on a farm surrounded by woods, and the first encounter I had with something unsettling would have been during a sleepover I had with two friends. After a riveting day running through the woods and having fun, we settled down for bed. It was a full moon, and the light pierced through the blinds that I had. My two friends were sleeping on the bottom bunk, while I slept on the top. They had fallen asleep, but I seemed not to be able to sleep, so I decided to peek through the blinds. The full moon stared at me, and I looked away for a second, but when I looked back, there was a creature. The head was shaped similar to that of a horse with glowing red eyes and shaggy, thick, dark brown hair. It was about two feet lower down than I was, right outside my window, eye level with me. The window was about six feet off the ground. The bunk bed was also about six foot. So this creature must have been about nine feet tall. I don't know what it was, but it certainly scared me, badly. Number two. My best friend C and my other best friend at the time K and I were all having a sleepover together outside in a tent. In our tent, we had one light, a small battery operated lantern. It was dark and quiet outside when all of a sudden a stick was hurled at our tent. My friend C felt that we were in danger, but didn't know from what. C had just moved from Arizona near the Navajo reservation and had recently experienced a skinwalker herself. We had no way to defend ourselves, so we decided to attempt to grab something that could be used as a defense from our car near the tent. C decided to be the one to go and grab it. As she went toward the car, she screamed. She immediately sprinted back with fear in her eyes. We asked her what happened, and she told us about a large figure with glowing red eyes resembling a wolf. We ended up leaving that tent for good later on. Finally, number three. As an avid trail runner, I am used to the woods in which I run. I tend to run near dusk as the sun is setting, but I refuse to run when it's dark. 
I feel at home in the forest. I've never feared it. Not until now. Only recently did I experience three odd phenomena. I began to feel like I was being watched while I ran. Yes, I know, the forest is always watching, with all of its animals watching what I'm doing, but this feeling is different. It's more of a fear-inducing feeling. Then about four days after this began, I saw these glowing orbs. Only a couple, but they led deeper and deeper into the woods. All of this led toward a place my father and I found when I was young, where a deer's rib cage was stuck in the hollow of a tree, almost as if it was put there purposely. There's also a big mound of rocks near it. Those rocks were not just randomly placed, they were formed, like a large rectangular shape similar to a grave. I haven't seen the orbs since, but it was unsettling. By far the most unsettling thing that has ever happened there would be the amount of times that I've felt something was following me or chasing me in the woods. I've even had this gut feeling that something was trying to lure me deeper into the woods. Whenever I feel that something is so off and that there are malicious intentions, I turn around and go back. The feeling of dread has only gotten stronger, and I'm at a loss for what might be causing it. My fiancé and I had just left Ripley's Believe It or Not in Wisconsin Dells, and he was getting hungry. Being that I only survive on antiques and Advil, I wasn't in such a hurry to find him any sustenance. I popped open Chad Lewis's book entitled Paranormal Wisconsin Dells and Baraboo that I had just picked up from Ripley's, and I began to thumb through it in the parking lot eager to find the next stop on our New Year's Day adventure. I settled on the old Baraboo Inn. I'll let you do your own research about it, but I wanted to share my own personal encounter there. Because unless Mr. B.C. Farr is a master electrician with a trick kill switch behind the bar, and there isn't, I absolutely believe that we had a bona fide paranormal experience at Wisconsin's most haunted tavern. According to Google, OBI has a fantastic menu. Depending upon which reviews you read, the food is good too. We set off to Baraboo and found the beautiful stately building easily enough, located at 135 Walnut Street. We went inside and all was quiet. I immediately started looking around, taking in the scene and after a beat or two, we were greeted by an enormous black lab from the back room and a man's voice excitedly welcoming us in. Before I was able to pinpoint where the voice was coming from, a smartly dressed jovial man in probably his 50s popped out from a door behind the bar and asked how we were doing and what brought us in today. I told him we were looking for a drink and a menu and he informed me that they no longer keep a kitchen but he would be more than happy to make us a drink. He said, do you know where you are right now? I laughed and told him that yes, we picked this place out of a book to sightsee, and he proceeded to tell us that we were in the most haunted tavern in Wisconsin. As this conversation transpired, he had begun making our bourbon sours and the jukebox had queued up Hey Tonight by CCR. I was watching him generously pour our drinks and I could see both of his hands for the duration of our exchange. Just as he took his thumb off of the soda gun, the jukebox quit. Just stopped, dead silent in the middle of a song. We all looked over to the old row that was still all lit up, but the number display was flashing zeros. The bartender, who apparently was the owner as well, turned his full body toward it and exclaimed, now what did you do that for? That was a good tune. He turned to me and said, You just gotta talk to them. Welcome to my world. He went back to finishing my fiancé's drink, handed it over to him and held mine for an extra second. He was eyeballing me, 
probably because I was still looking at the jukebox display. I'd never seen an older one like that just error out before, and I found it unusual. He said, that's never happened before. Are you a sensitive? Pardon? I jolted out of the sinking feeling I was having at not fully understanding what had just happened, and I hadn't realized he was talking to me. Are you a sensitive? He asked again. Do you believe in ghosts? I hesitated, not wanting to make a mark of myself, and I responded, Oh, um, kind of. Well, don't matter. They believe in you, he said. I haven't heard not a peep out of them all day until just now. They're responding to you. Either you're a sensitive or you brought something in here with you. You got some kind of energy. With that, he handed me my drink, waved away my money, and whisked us all to the gangster back bar, as he called it, to watch the episode of Hometown Haunting that just happened to have a feature on Baraboo and the old Baraboo Inn. It was a really neat experience, and that place is certainly invaluable for its historical significance alone. But if you ask me, my final summation is that they don't serve food, but they certainly got some kind of energy. BC Far knows how to make a good stiff one. I was hiking a section of the North Umpqua Trail in the northern part of Southern Oregon a few years back with my sister-in-law. It's a 72-mile trail, broken into sections that can be easily hiked in a day. At the time, I lived about midway up the trail, fairly remote, in a small community. It was mid-fall this one day when we set out. The trail was running along the south side of the North Umpqua River, and was pretty up and down in the beginning. We made it to a fairly flat section that was running just above the river. There was this beautiful view of the river through the trees, so we stopped to get some pictures and take a water break. I immediately felt extremely uncomfortable, like somebody was watching us. I slowly turned my head to look behind us, across the trail, and up. At the top of this very small incline, I could see a small meadow through the trees. Across the meadow, maybe 15 yards from us, was a tent an old canvas-style tent. As I'm looking, I notice bones strung from the trees all around the meadow, like creepy death wind chimes. My stomach just clenched and dropped. I leaned into my sister-in-law and whispered, Do not, not turn around and look behind us. Just continue walking up the trail and run when I tell you. We were close enough to the river that nobody who wasn't immediately next to us could have heard this. She did exactly as I told her to do, setting off at the brisk walk we'd been at before. We got maybe ten yards, and I could hear footsteps through the forest floor, coming from behind and slightly above us. That part of the forest is very dense. There's thick moss cover under the trees, so footsteps on it make a very specific sound. I leaned forward and told her to pick up her speed. She did. I did. And so did whoever was behind us. I leaned forward again and told her to run as fast as she could and not to stop until I told her so. For two middle-aged women, both slightly overweight, we ran like the wind. I just kept telling her, go, go, go. I could see ahead of us that the trail had an incline and then veered to the right along the river and around a cliff. I knew at that point that whoever it was was going to have to come down onto the trail or stop. We kept running. We probably ran at least a mile after that, even though we could no longer hear anybody behind or above us. That section of the trail was about nine miles, and we weren't halfway when this happened. We eventually slowed down, but just hurried as fast as we could the rest of the way. We had arranged for her younger brother to pick us up. 
We made it to the next trailhead fairly early, so we made our way out to 138 and started walking east toward home, knowing that he would find us. He did, and was shocked at our story. We got home and immediately called our local sheriff, who lived just above us at the ranger station. He came to the house and heard our story. He explained that it might be a day or two before they could get on the trail as they had a missing hunter at the time that they were searching for. So a few days go by and he shows up at our house to let me know that we weren't crazy or imagining things and that somebody really did chase us. I asked what they found and who it was. He looked at the floor and then looked up and said, I'm not going to tell you what we found or who it was because if I do, you'll never hike anywhere ever again. What we found was not normal, and it won't happen up here again. He then instructed me to never, ever hike unarmed again. I never found out what they found, or who it was. I never hiked that section of trail again, and it completely burned last year. I also never hike unarmed, ever. That was huge for me because I wasn't really a gun person at the time. But I am a living person and I'd like to stay that way, so I took his advice. I had many incidents living up there in the national forest with wild animals and other strange things, but nothing ever scared me as much as another human did that day. Something happened when I was camping 20 years ago, and I can't get it out of my head. If you have any ideas about what this might be, I'm very interested in hearing it. I was visiting my uncle and cousin, Sarah, in rural Pennsylvania. I was about 16, and Sarah was about 12. Sarah asked me if we could go camping, which meant pitching a tent at the top of this huge foothill that was on the property. The foothill was very steep and had woods at the top. I'd never been camping before then, but I figured if anything happened, we could just walk back down to the house. So I said, cool, no problem. We pitched the tent so the woods were directly behind it, with the tent opening facing out toward the scenery and the view. We roasted marshmallows, told campfire stories, and got in the tent around 11 p.m. or midnight. Sarah fell asleep right away but I couldn't, so I was just lying there counting sheep. Suddenly, I heard leaves shuffling in the woods behind the tent, and I heard footsteps coming out of the woods behind the tent. There were a few steps, and then it would stop. Then a few more, and as it got closer, I heard it step on some large rocks. It sounded like a really large hoof stepped on the rock, because it made that same clop sound as a horse. As it got closer to the tent, I could feel the impact of each step in the ground under me, so whatever it was sounded very heavy. At first I thought it was a large buck, and I debated waking up my cousin so she wouldn't miss it. But then it kept coming closer to the tent, closer than a deer or buck ever would have, and suddenly I was overcome with this feeling of full body dread, like something was very, very wrong. Then. I heard a really bizarre sound. It sounded like it was coming from about 8 to 10 feet off the ground, and the best way I can describe it is like someone had a huge roll of masking tape and was pulling off a big section at a time. It was this odd, tearing sound for lack of a better word, and each tearing sound was loud and lasted 2 to 3 seconds. I told myself that it was a deer, and that it was tearing bark off trees, and that's what was making the noise, but deep down I knew something was wrong. I didn't want to risk waking or scaring Sarah, so I just lay there as quietly as possible, praying that whatever it was would leave. But instead of leaving, the tearing sound got closer, still about 8 to 10 feet off the ground. Now it was directly behind the tent, within 5 to 10 feet. Right then, I heard Sarah scream whisper my name, and I realized she was awake and heard it too. 
She asked me what it was, and I told her that it was fine, that it was just a deer, and to go back to sleep. She said, that doesn't sound like a deer. But I insisted that it was, because I was too scared to make a run for the house with whatever this thing was right outside. So we listened to it slowly move around to the left side of the tent, still close, still making the sound every few seconds. And then, things got even weirder. It started moving around to the front of the tent, where the ground dropped off steeply, so each few feet forward was also several feet down. As this thing went around to the front, the sound stayed at the 8 to 10 foot height and was slowly moving to the right. Now, if the thing making this sound was standing on the ground, then the sound should have dropped several feet, but the sound stayed at the same height all the way around. I even wondered if it was a bird, but it was moving too slowly, and that wouldn't account for the hoof steps I had heard before. After the sound faded into the woods, Sarah and I just lay awake for the rest of the night, too afraid to leave the tent. At first light, we booked it back to the house and told my uncle what had happened. Even though he didn't know what it was, he just shrugged and didn't seem too concerned. But that experience scared me so much I've never been camping since, since I know I didn't hallucinate or imagine it because Sarah heard it too. Has anyone else ever heard of anything like this? I've asked friends who are avid outdoorsmen, hunters, and trackers, and none of them have ever heard of anything like it. I've had a long history of paranormal things happening to me, but these take the cake. I lived in the middle of Hicktown swamps in Georgia when these took place. When I was 13, I ran away from home for personal reasons. I booked it to a local nature trail in the middle of a wildlife reserve. I ran down in about 15 minutes, and a hand reached out from the bush to my right and hit me in the chest. I got back up and looked for my attacker, but there was nothing there. I proceeded to run home, crying like a real man. When I was 15, I was laying in bed, scrolling through creepypasta articles, when I hear a sort of rhythmic tapping on my window. I freak out and pretend I can't hear it for a while, until I can't stand it anymore. I pull the curtain back. It's only a raccoon. I hit the window and scare him off and try to calm myself down. About a half an hour later, the same tapping, the same rhythmic pattern. Kind of like click, click, scratch, click, click, scratch. So I decide I'm going to get my BB gun and take it out on the raccoon, scare him, you know, so he won't come back. So I grab my BB gun, I open the window, I take aim. And there's this shadowy figure that resembles a man staring right at me, right on the border of my lawn that connects my yard to the huge expanse of woods around my house. And it just stares at me and slowly walks into the woods behind it. After that, I didn't sleep for about a week. In fall of last year, on a walk down the nature trail with two of my friends, Antoine and Justin, we were just cracking jokes and drinking. It was 4 a.m. and we were just having a great time. On the walk back home, I feel this awful presence. I look behind me and I see something at the end of the trail in the distance. My vision isn't the best, but from what I could tell, it looked like a man with a deer head as his own. So I looked away. I told my friends not to say a word until we got home. Justin knew of my past occurrences, and he doesn't really mess around with paranormal stuff, so he listened and just kept walking. But Antoine just looked at me for like 15 minutes while walking perfectly straight. I freaked out and started doing the strangest movements of my arms to see if he would mimic them, and every time he would. At one point, I locked both my arms and put them on my head, and he did the exact same thing. I was ready to just leave him in the woods that night, honestly. 
Eventually he screamed something completely unintelligible and it scared the crap out of me. So I threw a punch at him and he dodged it. I apologized, told him to shut up and then told them all to run home with me. When we got there, we discussed what we had seen and what happened. And Antoine said that he completely blacked out as soon as we started walking the nature trail, only to wake up to me throwing a punch at him. About two months ago, another thing happened, and this was where I drew the line. I've moved since this incident, and I honestly don't plan on ever going back. I was walking down the nature trail again. Clearly, I hadn't learned my lesson. I was listening to music, having a good time, and this thick, permeable smell of blood hit my nose. I genuinely thought I had a nosebleed for a second until through my headphones, I hear somebody talking. I take off one of my headphones and have a look around. Nothing. Speed walking out of there, it happens again. And this time, it sounds exactly like a man screaming, war bringer. Instantly, I'm on the verge of tears. I jerk back and look around as fast as possible. And I see it. There's a fully naked man, resembling more of a corpse than a man, with a bleeding, rotting horse's head. His arm was extended out toward me. I ran home and packed my things. Now by this point, I have so many theories as to what happened, but I hate indulging them. They all scare the hell out of me. My current idea is that I'm just nuts. I'm not sure, but whatever the case is, if there's anyone here who can explain what I saw, I'm very open to it. For my lady's birthday, I took her to Gatlinburg, a popular, touristy, one main boardwalk town in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. We camped the first night, a few miles out in the woods at a popular location, Elkmet Campground. The campground was beautiful, tall green trees like baby redwoods, a clear water river scattered by checkered rocks, families with little ones running around, it was great. Through borrowing a tent, we found that we had no steaks and headed into town for supplies, whiskey, and hot dogs. It was dusk by the time we made it back to the campground. Most campers were surrounding their dissipating fires or cleaning up before the quickly coming night. Our tent was still up, but crunched up a little without the steaks allowing it to spread open as widely as it could. We fixed our tent and started a fire. As our night progressed, we found ourselves surrounding our campfire two to three hours later around midnight. Now, this was the sort of campground where another campsite is just 30 yards from yours. Bears frequent the area, and my girlfriend was already freaking out a little bit, which is why I booked our site in the dead center of the whole campground. All the other campers had gone to bed at this point, and the only sound we could hear was the slowly crackling fire and the light stream of the river flowing into the rocks. The clouds were covering a crescent moon, so there wasn't much light to begin with. We had flashlights and I would occasionally shine the light around us while avoiding hitting the other campers to confirm that we were fine and that there were no bears. Seemingly out of nowhere, from the campsite behind my girlfriend and to my left, a light shined directly on us and then all around in a frantic yet focused manner, kind of like the Eye of Sauron. I saw what appeared to be a man with the strangest gait I've ever seen. He wore a headlight and was focused on his picnic table. The man's gait seemed to me to be a little bit like Jar Jar Binks, just not normal. I could see through my periphery that the man focused his light on the picnic table, and whenever I turned my head toward him, immediately his light would hit my girlfriend and I. I could only see the outline of the man through the light of his headlight and the occasional flash of my light at his campsite once he continued to flash his light at ours in a very disconcerting way. This was the campsite across from us, where we saw no one at all the night prior. I could only see the outline of his body as all black, as if he was in an all black bodysuit. 
His movements were eerily repetitious. For what went on to close to an hour, this man would shine his headlight on his picnic table, make limited motions with his hands, if any at all, then walk five steps back to his tent, shine his headlight at his tent, then walk back to the picnic table, shine his light at us, and repeat it all over again. If this was just the man looking for something, he was on a cocktail of drugs. Once his light was on us for too long for comfort, I shined my flashlight on him for an extended period of time. It was at this moment when I went from annoyed to fight or flight. A chill ran down my back as I saw the outline of the man disappear in front of me and the light from his headlight bounce down to the ground, then fly across the ground from his campsite. It seemed to jump along the ground and into the bushes diagonally from both of our campsites. It wasn't like the headlight had been thrown, but as if it ran across the ground, like if it was on the head of a dog. I took my flashlight away and watched his light slowly come back out of the bushes and climb back up to the height of a person. The shadow figure returned back, walking out of the bushes and back to the campsite to continue the same odd behavior. There were no sounds at all coming from this figure throughout the entirety of the night. Sometime later, we went into the tent for shut-eye and the shadow man figure was still at his odd routine. The following day, the tent from the shadow man's campsite was gone, like no one had ever been there. I then found out that just a mile from our campsite was a small town called Elkmont Ghost Town, with abandoned buildings and a cemetery up a trail a bit. I couldn't find any other stories of Elkmont mysteries, but I wouldn't be surprised if there are other stories involving the headlight man. My mother married an older man about nine years ago, whose previous wife had died from cancer several years beforehand. We moved into his home, and I was about 13 years old at the time. I had always felt an odd feeling in this home, as my room was in the basement. Nothing out of the ordinary happened here, besides the odd being watched feeling that I would always experience in that home. My mom had hired my biological father, who I'm close to, to remodel the downstairs bathroom in my stepdad's home. My dad told me he had several of his tools moved around while he was alone working at the place. My dad finished the job and never returned. Fast forward to when my stepdad, mom, and I moved to Washington State. He and my mother began to have a lot of issues and were arguing frequently. I won't go into it, but I came to learn that my stepfather had a certain type of addiction that led him to having many women in our home that were not his wife, many of whom were professionals in this trade and were younger than his own 30-year-old children. I found this very concerning for a number of reasons, and there are some other details that, like I said, I won't go into, but let's just say it was evident that this guy had some very serious issues. He really gave me the creeps. I told my mother and she was dismissive of it, but she gave off the vibe that I wasn't telling her anything she didn't already know. I wanted to get away from him and everything he was doing, and he bought a vacation home in Western Arizona. I was 18 at the time and I moved down there and I was living on my own. He had most of his items and furniture from his old home in this house that I was staying at alone in Arizona. A couple of weeks go by and I'm lying in my bed in my room. I heard footsteps that sounded like somebody wearing slippers, scuffling along the tile floor in the living room. I was totally scared after that and I couldn't sleep. About a week after this, the hall bathroom shower was having problems so I used the master bathroom shower. I had an awful feeling that I was being watched in the master bath as well as the master bedroom and the closet. It was such a bad feeling that I no longer went into that bedroom and I was frightened to even be on that side of the house. 
When I was done showering, I was near running through the bathroom and bedroom, shutting the door behind me. The same week, I was playing computer games in the office, and the desk was facing the living room. I was sitting in my chair, and I just felt like I was being watched again. I felt something touch my right shoulder. I jumped and looked behind me, but nothing was there. I was pretty spooked, but I sat back down and continued with my game. Then, maybe an hour after feeling something touch my shoulder, while still playing my game, I suddenly heard a very loud slam near the side of the house where the master bedroom is. Maybe 10 to 15 seconds after the slam, I heard several knocks along the wall on the same side of the house. I was frozen in fear. I stood up at my desk and all I could do was let out a scream. I called my mother hysterical and explained to her what had happened. Two days later, she drove over a thousand miles to come get me and take me back home. When I returned home, I found out that she was divorcing my stepdad, sending him to live in the house in Arizona that I had just come from. After he was gone, I didn't experience much in my mom's house beside that feeling of being watched. I opted to stay upstairs. It was a split level home with the living room and kitchen upstairs and my bedroom downstairs. I was upstairs in the living room when my mom's dog stood at the top of the stairs, staring downward at the base of the stairs, growling, frozen still. Soon after that, my mother sold the house and I moved out of state and I've never experienced anything like that since. I'm still wondering if there are any explanations as to what might have occurred. I believe this might have been paranormal, and I haven't experienced anything like this since, nor had I ever experienced anything until living in the same home that my mom's ex-husband lives in. from a small town in the middle of Denmark, and my grandfather used to live about 10 kilometers from us. He was what you would roughly translate as a nature caretaker. He lives at the place and gets paid to take care of it. The place that he lived was in a protected area in the forest, just where Denmark's biggest river meets a huge lake. The place had a lot of old buildings, an old paper factory, and a water mill. It used to be run by the monks of the Benedictine order. They built the mill to utilize the water stream to power the machines at the paper factory. The place is basically called the Monastery Mill. Most buildings are from the late 1500s to 1700s, but some of them are from 1100. All the way up until the 1800s, the place was run by the monks. On the other side of the river lived the nuns of the Benedictine order, who were said to have a bad relationship with the monks. No one really knows what started this feud. Firstly, it was small. Food would go missing from the monks' stock. Then the water mill would stop, and they would realize an insane amount of wood was blocking the water. Lastly, they would wake up to find cattle and chickens had been killed. And one night, the paper factory, which was built entirely of wood, was set on fire. Ever since that day, nobody had seen the monks. Everyone thought that they had left the mill to go somewhere else, as the order had many monasteries across the country. Well, four years ago, when I had just turned 18, my granddad was going hunting in Sweden. He asked me if I could take care of his place and his dogs for a couple of days, and since I didn't have a car yet, I would just sleep there and take the bus to school in the morning. The place is beautiful, and I was so excited to spend some time there. When I went to sleep the first night, I was woken up at exactly 12 o'clock by what sounded like a small church bell. It rang for a couple of minutes, and then it stopped. 
A small bell the monks used to use to call mass was just outside my granddad's house, so I assumed that's what I had heard. But when I woke up the next morning and checked out the bell, it was tied tightly, so no wind or person could have made that bell ring. The next night it happened again. It woke me up at exactly midnight and rang for a couple of minutes. I slowly made my way to the front door, which was made of glass, to look at the bell. And there were my granddad's two dogs, looking out while growling. I swear when I looked out, I saw a bald man wearing a long white dress robe type thing disappearing into the woods, almost like he was floating. I called my dad sobbing and asked him to come and pick me up, and he did. We both went back the next day, checked on the bell, and it was still tied up. My dad then confided in me that even though he doesn't believe in that stuff, as he put it, he had had many weird experiences as a kid there, and he still couldn't find any explanation for most of them. Fast forward to last year. My granddad was still living there, and the council decided to split the river and make it wider. Had something to do with the forest environment. I didn't really exactly get why. It took weeks for them to plan it out. And then, the day came when all the machinery to start the expansion got kicked on. They only got to work for a couple of hours though, until they had to stop, because as they were digging, they had found bones. Just a couple, no big deal. But what they soon realized was that by the river, on the monk's side, there was a mass grave. After specialists were called and weeks of digging commenced, they approximated that the grave had about 40 bodies in it, all from the 1800s. At that point, everyone realized that the monks had never left. What happened to them at that paper factory, though? No one knows.